Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Baker Institute. I'm delighted to see you all. I'm particularly happy to see members of our roundtable, um, of our board. Uh, this is a very significant event, not just because of the content um, elections, presidential elections, presidential election reform is always a critical topic for the United States, but especially at this moment, a bipartisan approach to looking at these issues is, to put it mildly, unusual. It has not been an academic undertaking. It has been exceedingly practical, and it has succeeded in the passage of one of the very few electoral reform laws, this one on the ministerial um, authority of the vice president during the counting of the votes um, prior to the actual inauguration. It was designed to eliminate one of the difficulties or confusions um, or distortions that potentially arose during the January 6th events. And that has been signed into law. That is a tribute to the program on elections, to the Carter Center, and our partnership here at Baker with them. In 2017, Secretary Baker uh, came forward with an idea for a focus upon presidential elections. It was part of the Institute's desire to be involved in a practical manner where we believed we had value added um, in partnership to try to advance these issues. And in the brief time since, as I noted, we have been successful. Now, that fall of 2017, as an underscoring of the bipartisan character of this program, political gurus Karl Rove and David Axelrod served as honorary chairs of the first presidential elections program. And since then, politicians, academicians, office holders, and pollsters have convened before the beginning of each presidential primary cycle and after the following presidential election to discuss the issues involved. Uh, today's event is an outgrowth of that program, one that continues a tradition that has the namesakes uh, of our two institutes, Carter and Secretary Baker, um, which started in 2005 when those two co-chaired the Bipartisan Commission on Federal Election Reform. They both understood what President Carter meant about living in a democracy when he said it is every citizen's right and duty to help shape the future legacy of our nation. And they also understood the importance of bipartisanship and the role it plays in what Secretary Baker calls getting the people's business done, a message which could not be underscored more sharply uh, given the situation we face today. And so President Carter and Secretary Baker strove to come up with recommendations that could gain support from both sides of the political aisle, that could make voting more secure without limiting turnout. A lot's happened since then, as I noted and as you all know, and there is less and less inclination of the two sides to come together. Sadly, what became known as the Carter-Baker Commission was the last time such a bipartisan approach has been um, attempted. Today, amidst political rancor, division, the envenoming of political discourse, it's increasingly hard to get the people's work done. We hope conversations like the one we are having today will help us find solutions, not just admire the problem, uh, to how we vote in the United States today. So I want to thank all of those here, including the experts, who will be participating in this event. Um, I hope you have a very good discussion uh, with highest regard for the Carter Center, its staff, its leadership. Um, have a great conversation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Avery Davis Roberts, and I'm an associate director in the democracy program at the Carter Center. Our CEO, Paige Alexander, planned to be here with us today and to welcome all of you to this event. But unfortunately, the airlines 
did not agree with her plans and her flight out of South Sudan was canceled and she wasn't able to make it to be here in time uh, to be with us this morning. So on behalf of Paige Alexander and the Carter Center, let me also add our welcome to all of you here today in person and online across the country and around the world. I'd of course like to start with a few word of, words of thanks. Thank you to the Baker Institute for Public Policy for hosting us here in Houston. Thanks to Secretary Baker and Ambassador Sattersfield for their leadership and vision. Thank you, John and Mark and Laura and the entire BIP team for being such good collaborators and wonderful hosts. We at the Carter Center are grateful for our partnership with you. It is a partnership that was born of the mutual respect between President Carter and Secretary Baker, but that now stands on its own two feet. It's a partnership that we value and that we look forward to continuing. My colleagues and I are thrilled to be here for the third, second in person, annual Carter Baker convening on US elections. When we convened this time last year in Atlanta, we were all still reeling from the 2020 elections. We were grappling with how we could come together as a nation to have frank discussions about our elections when many Americans are not always living in a shared reality or operating from a shared perception of the facts. We were living under the shadow of legislative changes in Texas and Georgia and other states around the country that had the potential to adversely affect participation in elections and public perceptions of election integrity. Last year in Atlanta, we also talked at length about the challenges facing election officials, the frontline workers of our democracy, many of whom have been the targets of threats, harassment, and vitriol at worst, and at best, are often just really tired and burnt out from working in such a challenging political environment. And we had all of these conversations uncertain of what the 2022 midterms would bring and what they might mean for trust and confidence on our electoral institutions. Now that we are on the other side of 2022 and have the midterms in our rearview mirror, we have a better sense of the road ahead of us. We can see the challenges that remain to restore confidence in our elections, and they are many, and they are significant. But we can also see where there may be room for cautious optimism about the future of our democracy. We are looking forward to today's discussions. We will build on some of those conversations that we had last year and in 2021, but we will also reflect on what we learned in 2022 and look forward to what we might anticipate in 2024. We want to thank our friends at the Baker Institute for suggesting the lunchtime conversation reflecting on President Carter's work to support credible elections around the world. Putting the conversation we will have about US democracy and elections into the context of global experience can help us to see that the challenges we face are at times shared with others, that we are not alone, and that there are lessons that we can take from other parts of the world. The care and respect shown to President Carter, his family, and the Carter Center these last few months since the announcement of his hospice care have been humbling and so appreciated. We are grateful for opportunities like this one to reflect on what President Carter's life and leadership can continue to teach us and how his commitment to unchanging principles and changing times will continue to infuse our work in the years to come. Among those principles is the commitment to engaging in constructive conversation, to trying to build together rather than tear down, and to build partnerships with people who come to the table with different perspectives, approaches, and opinions from our own. And that is exactly what President Carter and Secretary Baker did when they co-chaired the Federal Commission on Electoral Reform in 2005. They each came to the table with political perspectives and opinions that differed, but they, all, they came to that table with respect for one another. They focused on what they had in common and where they could reach agreement. They dug down in the details of the things where they had differences of opinion, and they used their well-honed negotiation skills to finalize the recommendations in the commission's final report. Before I turn over to John for, to introduce the first session, I would be remiss if I didn't say that among the many things that President Carter and Secretary Baker have in common is a commitment to action, to getting work done, as Ambassador Sattersfield said. We very much hope that the conversations that we have today will spur you to action, will inspire you to help do the work of our democracy, whether that is signing up to be a poll worker, which you should definitely do, or just sharing some of the things you learned today with others in your networks and in your community. 
With that, I will turn over to John to introduce the first panel. Thank you. Good morning. After listening to Avery, I think you can understand how much I, why we enjoy working with her and David and Paige and the rest of the crowd at the Carter Center. It's been a, a really rewarding experience. I'm John Williams of the Baker Institute, and in the aftermath of the contentious 2020 presidential election, Georgia and Texas took center stage in the media spotlight for the changes that their legislatures made in the way elections are conducted in each state. Republicans said the laws were needed to protect the integrity of the ballot box. Meanwhile, Dem and Democrats, many Democrats, assailed the new laws as in those states as being Jim Crow 2.0, measures that could hinder minority participation. In this panel, our, in this uh, session, our panel of experts will take a hard look at the new laws and provide insight into how they may have affected voter turnout in the 2020 midterm elections in those two states. Our moderator today is going to is Alexandra Such Bass. She's a senior, senior correspondent for politics, technology, and society for The Economist who covers a wide range of political and public policy topics. Our panelists today are the Honorable Brad Raffensperger, Georgia's 29th Secretary of State, first elected in 2018 and overwhelmingly reelected in 2022. Mark Jones, professor of the Department of Political Science at Rice University, who, who wears many hats, including being my colleague at the Baker Institute, who co-directs the presidential elections program with me. And last but not least, David Becker, the Soratorial Splendor, Executive Director and Founder of the nonpartisan nonprofit Center for Election Innovation and Research. He works with election officials of both parties to assure accessible, secure elections for all el eligible voters. In a second, we'll turn the, the, the discussion over to Alexander to moderate, but first, Mark Jones has a presentation he'd like to give. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank you, John, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, it's a pleasure always to work with the Carter Center as well as our numerous colleagues who have taken the time to come here uh, and join us. And today what I'm going to do is talk about something that John just touched on, and that is the experience of Georgia and Texas voters in 2022 in the midterm elections following the passage of legislation in 2021. So uh, we had two pieces of legislation passed in 2021, uh, Georgia Senate Bill 202 and Texas Senate Bill 1. If you remember here in Texas, that was after a few delays with Democratic quorum breaks uh, at the end of May and then in the after the first special session. But eventually both pieces of legislation passed. And our main goal with the survey we did, which is representative of voters in both Texas and Georgia, is to understand the experience that these voters had during the 2022 elections. And so for that, we surveyed a representative group of uh, 1,200 uh, Georgia voters and 1,600 Texas voters, larger group in Texas in order to ensure uh, representative groups of the state's African-American population. So you do a little oversampling there. Uh, what we found was that, by and large, um, voters in Texas and Georgia had a good experience in their elections. So the first question we asked was, what was your experience in terms of voting in the 2022 elections? And uh, over half thought it was excellent. Uh, and if you put ha excellent and good together, nine out of 10 believed that their experience in the elections was excellent or good. And that didn't differ in terms of race or ethnicity. Uh, for African-American voters, white voters, or Latino voters uh, in Georgia and Texas, nor did it differ for Democrats and Republicans. They were all positive. Uh, and so what, and throughout this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on these two sort of sub-demographic groups, ethnicity and race, and partisanship. We, of course, have a host of other data, but for time reasons, I'm going to focus on the two that often are most salient when discussing elections, that is, ethnicity and race and partisanship. So one of the things we asked was about voters' experience getting to the polls. Um, how long did it take them to get there? And what we found is that for a majority of voters, it was less than 10 minutes. If you add in voters uh, less than 20 minutes, uh, pretty much 9 out of 10 voters were able to get to the polling place in less than 20 minutes. In terms of ethnic racial differences, 
uh, they weren't all that strong, although on average, uh, white voters were able to get to the polling places in less than 10 minutes at a higher rate than African-American voters. Uh, but if you'd say, okay, instead of looking at 10 minutes, we're gonna say less than tw 20 minutes or less, then the racial ethnic differences disappear. Uh, so the, to the extent to which there's a difference, white voters were able to get to the polls a little quicker, less than 10 minutes, at a significantly higher rate than African-American voters. But if you move it to 20 minutes, it washes out. And the same thing is true with partisanship. Uh, Republican voters generally were able to get to polling places in less than 10 minutes at a higher rate than Democratic voters. But if you say, okay, let's say 20, 20 minutes or less, once again, the results wash out. We also wanted to talk about lines. So that was a big issue with, with a lot of this legislation was passed, uh, that there would be longer lines and that that would cause a significant um, reduction in people's ability to exercise their right of suffrage. What we found is that you know, in uh, Georgia, 26% uh, of voters had no weight when they showed up to vote, and that was in, in Texas it was 31%. If you add together people who waited less than 10 minutes, that's seven out of 10 Texans and six out of 10 Georgians. Uh, when you get to higher levels, in Georgia there were slightly higher rates as you get down into the 21, 30 minute range, 41, 60 minute range, but by and large, wait times overall were relatively low, uh, less than uh, 20 minutes in almost, in about eight out of 10 cases. In terms of uh, ethnic racial differences, uh, there really were none to speak of in terms of wait times for polling places. Uh, nor were there any in terms of partisanship, uh, with the modest exception that Georgia Republicans had a slightly lower wait times than Georgia Democrats at the uh, no wait. But if you say less than 10 minutes, then once again, the results wash out. So by and large, what we're seeing here are not much in the way of ethnic, racial, or partisan differences in terms of the experiences of travel time, overall experience, or uh, wait times. Uh, now, one thing that we did notice in the data, and this is sort of an interesting factor, is that uh, if you see here uh, the wait times for Georgia on election day, 41% of voters had no, no wait time whatsoever, whereas in Texas, it was 27%. So it's a, a significantly lower amount. One, and, and what that reveals is in Texas, uh, we overwhelmingly use election day vote centers. 83% uh, of Texans vote at where that's where you can vote in, at any vote center in your county. Now that's very convenient in the sense that you, don't, you can go wherever you want. In Georgia, you, you're actually on election day, you have to go to a specified place. So while in theory that's very good for Texas because it means you can go anywhere in Harris County if you're a resident here, anywhere in Montgomery County if you're a resident there, what we had in Harris County though, and in throughout Texas are longer lines because it's more difficult for people to coordinate. Voters aren't coordinating, election officials aren't coordinating. And so what we saw in Texas is on election day, uh, we had a much larger percentage of people, or a smaller percentage of people in Texas who had wait times on the election day voting, something that didn't happen in early voting. So the early voting experience in Texas, you had lower, shorter lines and you waited less than in Georgia, but on election day, Georgia, which requires people to go to specific, a specific polling place, was able to get people through the polls much quicker, whereas in Texas, we had much longer delays, uh, in part because everyone went to the same polling place. So if you, everyone went to West Gray here, uh, as opposed to the 30 other places that were around. And so as a result, uh, it's something that Texas probably needs to work on in terms of figuring how to, how to better coordinate uh, its election day vote centers so that we don't have all people going to one place and waiting an hour or two hour long lines while other places remain vacant. That's the advantage of the Georgia system since you know exactly where you're supposed to go, you know exactly through the past how many people voted the, the polling place, you can move it uh, and make it far more efficient. And you don't run out of ballots, which we did in a, for a few places here in Harris County. Okay. Now, we also asked people when they, uh, sh when they showed up to, to vote, were they asked uh, to provide a photo ID? Now, in theory, everybody under law should provide a photo ID. Uh, however, we had about you know, one in 20 residents of both Georgia and Texas said they were not asked to provide a photo ID. So at least in terms of what they're reporting, they didn't provide a photo ID. Now, these numbers are so small that the, there's no significant relationship. Uh, between ethnicity and race, just because it, when you're dealing with one in 20 with a population of this size, you can't really say anything. Um, there was slight, it was slightly more prominent among African Americans, but not in a statistically significant way. 
Uh, then in terms of the voter photo ID, uh, what this number shows here is everybody uses their driver's license. Uh, so it's 99% you know, uh, uh, for 98.7% for Georgia, 96% for Texas. Each state allows you to have a host of other IDs, passports, election IDs, uh, concealed handgun license here in Texas. Uh, in Georgia, it's a little broader. You could have uh, municipal employee IDs, uh, public school, I uh, public college and university IDs. But what we find is pretty much everybody uses a driver's license. Uh, it's very rare that someone is showing up and using something other than a driver's license. We also asked people about whether they, their polling place was easy to find, whether the poll workers were helpful, and whether they thought their ballot privacy was protected. Overwhelmingly, everyone says yes. It's, you know, we're in the 98, 99 percent range. And we also asked if people thought the ballot was too long. Uh, that's, a quite, that's an issue that often comes up here in Texas. That was more, significantly more likely to be the response of Texas voters than it was in Georgia voters, in part due to the fact that uh, Georgia, while it does elect, uh, while Georgia does elect their judges, they do it in a slightly different way that makes their ballot less long than we have here in Texas. We also asked people if their electronic voting machines were malfunctioning. Uh, um, nine out of ten people said they were not. Now, there w in the terms of the ballot length, the only really interesting finding was here in Texas. Uh, for all of you that vote in Harris County, uh, that's a, over half of Harris County residents believe that our ballot is too long. Elsewhere in the state, it's, it's pretty much, it doesn't matter if you're in Dallas or if you're in Loving County or if you're in, uh, in Bastrop, everybody's pretty much the same, about a third. But Harris County with our you know, 100 uh, races that you're uh, required to vote in, a majority of people do think that's too long. But of course, as long as we have partisan election of judges, we're gonna continue with that number. But it is, I think, a signal that at least in the eyes of Harris County, vo Texas voters believe their ballot's too long. Harris County voters really believe their ballot's too long. So we also asked people, one of the concerns in both states was that it was going to be more difficult to uh, vote via mail ballot than previously. By and large, we didn't get that response from voters. Uh, Georgia voters, 9 out of 10, said it was either very easy or somewhat easy to vote by mail. Uh, and 85% of Texas voters said the same thing. So only a small proportion of people found the mail ballot process to be difficult, although it was, you know, from an objective perspective, voting at least in Texas by mail was more difficult than it had been previously, but that didn't seem to be a, a significant barrier for most voters. We also asked about if people uh, experienced or witnessed voter intimidation uh, in the process, in, during the election process. And so here on the left, we have people that said they explicitly witnessed voter intimidation. That's 2% in Georgia, 3% in Texas. We then have another group that is those that said they witnessed it, or they said that they are unsure if they witnessed it or not, 4% in Georgia, 5% in Texas. And then people who personally experienced some form of intimidation, 2% in Georgia, 2% in Texas. Now, once again, these are very small numbers, so you can't, we can't do anything statistically, but African Americans in both Georgia and Texas were more likely than white uh, voters to report that they both uh, experienced voter intimidation as well as witnessed it. Uh, so, but it's, this is something maybe to look at in the future with a larger sample of specific populations. Statistically, we can't say this is a significant result, but we can say that there's a potential, something to look at in the future. Uh, and this is just from the partisanship perspective. Democrats were a little more likely than Republicans, but it wasn't as sharp a difference as we found between African Americans and whites. So this is sort of, you know, this is something that the Carter Center and the Baker Center are going to be looking at a little bit in the future. This is one example of it. In the United States, unlike most countries in the world, we leave it to the states to determine a lot of things about their elections. Most countries essentially centralize that in the national government. Right here, we have the different types of voting machines that are used. Across the, the, across the country. And the ones that deserve the, the light green ones and the red ones are the ones that we're trying to move away from. Those are the ones that lack a voter verified paper trail to be able to sort of do as an effective recount. Uh, you can see Texas, we're one of the craziest in the sense that we allow all of our counties to go all over the place. Uh, Georgia's more uniform now. So this is Georgia. They use all the same method, very simple, very easy to understand. Uh, very reliable, and we, we've seen that in the past elections when they've needed to do a recount. Uh, it's gone very smoothly. Texas is a little more all over the place. Uh, 
and the red counties are the ones that the ones that we're most worried about. That's places like Waller's close to us, Waller, Madison, Polk, uh, Victoria. Uh, those are counties where they still use, remember the old machine we had here in Harris County with the little thing that you twirled? Uh, they still use that machine. That machine doesn't provide any uh, paper trail. And so you vote electronically and then the result goes in there. Uh, that's the type of system that's still used in a small number of cases in Texas. We're moving away from that, uh, and we're supposed to be done after the next election cycle, but we still have that. And so we asked voters about these different methods, and, sort of, and this is for Texas and Georgia voters. What do they think about electronic voting machines that produce a paper record and then are hand audited, or those that just provoke machines that just provo uh, provide a paper record, or paper ballots that are counted by hand, all, about two-thirds of voters in both Georgia and Texas believe that those uh, provide a accurate and valid and trustworthy result. So those are methods that are highly valued, highly trusted. Uh, the machine that is least trusted is electronic voting machines with no paper record, like Harris County used to use uh, uh, prior to the 2022 uh, election. Uh, those only one in four uh, Georgians or Texans trust that type of voting method to provide an accurate tally of the results. Uh, now, good, there are no really ethnic racial differences. We can move past here. And partisan differences pretty much across the board. Democrats are far more trusting of all of the different methods than are Republicans. So whether it's uh, at the top, the voting machine, the most trusted, that's electronic voting machines that produce a paper record, Overwhelming majority of Democrats support that, uh, 85%, 87%, only 60% of Republicans do. And then it drops down, sort of the same thing. Democrats are always more trusting of all of the different methods than our Republicans, even though overall on the higher methods, about two thirds of Texans and Georgians are supportive of them. This is the sort of flipping it around uh, distrust. The one machine that people really distrust are the electronic voting machines with a paper record. Uh, and once again, we find uh, similar ethnic and racial differences. I won't spend too much time there. Now, this is a final thing I want to focus on. And these are sort of the two main methods by which we mo vote. So moving away from the idea of which type of voting machine, but whether you're voting in person or by mail. And so the question here is, how much do, do, what extent do people trust the voting system to provide an accurate and valid uh, uh, tally of the votes. And the options, you can trust it, you can distrust it, or you can neither trust or distrust. Eight out of 10, or 78 and 79% of Texans and Georgians trust in-person voting. That that's going to give you an accurate, valid result. Um, only eight or 9%, one in 10, distrust it. So in-person voting is pretty much overwhelmingly trusted by everybody. Mail ballots, though, are very different. Mail ballots are trusted by 36% of Texans, distrusted by 45% of Texans. Uh, mail ballots are trusted by 40% of Georgians, distrusted by 43%. So, and this is a change. This is something that if we were, if I'd done this survey back in 2014, uh, we would not be seeing these types of results. But what we've seen, particularly with President Trump over the past, say, three election cycles, is this growing distrust in uh, mail ballots. Uh, here we have it by race or ethnicity. Uh, there's no real difference in voting in person trust. Uh, black uh, Georgians and black Texans, though, are significantly more likely than white Georgians and white Texans to uh, trust uh, mail ballots. What re that's really factoring in, though, is that's partisan. It's the partisan split. And this is where we see, for instance, 69% of Georgia uh, uh, of George, or sorry, 69% of Georgia Democrats. Uh, or I'm sorry, 70 percent of Georgia Democrats trust mail and absentee ballots. Only 13 percent of Georgia Republicans do. So it's significantly less. 69 uh, percent of Texas Republicans uh, or 69 percent of Texas Democrats trust mail and absentee ballots compared to 10 percent Republicans. So only 10 percent of uh, Re Texas Republicans and 13 percent of Georgia Republicans trust mail and absentee ballots. That number is uh, crater. It used to be much higher. In, in fact, it was so high in 2014 or 2012 that we never actually asked questions about it because everybody trusted the system. That has dramatically changed. And then the final thing to focus in on uh, is, uh, is distrust. 
Uh, three out of four Republicans in Georgia and Texas distrust mail and absentee ballots compared to 43% uh, of Democrats in both states. So overall, what we've seen over the past uh, three to four election cycles is a real movement away from trusting mail and absentee ballots to distrust with that across the aisle, that is Democrats now distrust uh, mail ballots less than they did before, but it's dramatic among Republicans. Republicans now have lost pretty much all faith in mail and absentee ballots. And so we've seen as a result of that, a dramatic drop in uh, use of mail and absentee ballots by the Republican party and Republican candidates and Republican voters over the past few cycles. I'm gonna stop there so we can have time to discuss all of these issues and more, uh, but thank you very much. And I think uh, Alexandra, uh, Secretary, Be or Secretary Raffensperger, and David Becker, can join us. Everyone. Mark, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, thank you so much to the Baker Institute and the Carter Center for organizing this discussion on such an important and timely topic. It's my delight to be here today with um, my panelists who have already been introduced, but just quickly, Secretary Raffensperger, otherwise known as a national hero for standing up to attempts um, at election meddling by President Trump. I'm, I'm underselling you, I think. Um, Professor Jones, who you've heard from, and David Becker also is here. So um, could we start, I mean, the way that Mark framed it was pretty startling about how quickly the descent into distrust has been. And the suggestion was that this is a very recent phenomenon um, and very much stirred by President Trump. Um, I'd love to hear from both David and Secretary Raffensperger. Is this, is this how you see it? Um, or can, can you give us your view on the recent history of what's caused this? Secretary Raffensperger, I'll start with you. Well, with SB 202, we put it in place for the very first time, photo ID for absentee voting. What people don't realize is that we'd been sued by both, both the Democrat Party and the Republican Party both of them had said that signature match was subjective. And as an engineer, I agree. In fact, I ran in 2018 said we need to go to photo ID. So when we modeled SB 202, we actually uh, followed the process very similar to what they had been using in Minnesota. And they're really the forefronters of all of this. So Minnesota, Nebraska, and Kansas have been using this, and Texas copied us mm -hmm. because we, our General Assembly met first. Mm -hmm. And so you put that over the, you know, over the finish line also. So we, what we know it does is that it really elevates security in the process with the driver's license number. It's photo ID based. And by doing that, we, we believe that we've elevated confidence in the process. But the other issue that's not part of this is that one of the reasons I think people don't tr trust the absentee ballot process, they think that there's unregistered people or people that shouldn't be that are really Georgians voting in these elections. And therefore, I think it's really important that we stay, uh, become members of multi-state organizations such as ERIC, the Electronic Registration Information Center. And I've been very clear that we're not pulling out because I wanna make sure we're sure we have the cleanest voter ro rolls possible because it helps our election directors. But also if the rolls are clean, then what we really do, I also give voters confidence in the process. So I think that needs to be shored up. And it's interesting that the Republican Party has a proponent that has really disparaged absentee voting and also now has disparaged you know, the Electronic Registration Information Center, which is a nonpartisan, bipartisan system. In fact, we had more Republican states that were members of that. So I think those are two things, but I think it's, it's a fact. And so we're looking at your data, you know, thank you, Professor. Uh, it was great data to really see, and that we need to get that message out because confidence is really important to really the safety and the security of your democracy. You know, people need to feel comfortable that they can trust the results. When you can't trust the results, then that's really when you start going down a path that's not healthy. Yeah. Dave, David, please catch up the yeah. history too. Yeah, Mark uh, alluded to this. If you if you looked at this these polling numbers ten years ago, they'd look very very different. And um, if you look at the history of the expansion of mail voting in the United States, it was mostly done out west and mostly done by Republicans. It was something that was used as a way. If you think about the people who are most likely to use the mail, they are generally older, they are disproportionately white, and they are property owners. What party does that sound more like? Um, and 
So you'd see in states, Arizona is a wonderful example of this, where um, the Arizona Republican Party actually, in governing power, expanded mail voting access for uh, Arizonans. They've been voting by mail almost entirely, roughly 80 to 90 plus percent of uh, every election is all mail ballots, um, for over two decades. And uh, what, if, if you talk to Arizona Republicans, they're actually baffled by the, the switch to some degree because it used to be the way that the Republican Party actually held somewhat of an advantage. They were able to turn their voters out before Election Day. Every vote of yours you turn out before Election Day is a vote you've banked. It means someone you don't have to get out the vote on Election Day. It's a wonderful political tool. So that's, that was what we were seeing. And now what we've seen is largely due to disinformation about the security of mail balloting, a shift away from that by one party and one party only. And uh, in addition, you see an embrace of it by the other party where that might not have been there before. I, we did a study in California of mail balloting. And if you look at um, where they have a choice of going and voting in person early on election day or voting by mail, all very easy, very similar to what, what's done in Georgia. It's a little, there's some tweaks there. There's some differences that, in California. But most voters have an easy choice. And um, people of color tended to choose voting in person at higher rates than voting by mail through 2018. There has been a shift after that. And this is largely, again, driven by disinformation, not by actual voter choice based on facts. Um, it's not that mail voting is better than voting in person in actuality. It's not. It's just as secure. There are protections in place. Um, but one advantage that offering multiple choices for voters and how they cast ballots. And Georgia, again, is a great example of this because in Georgia, it is, it is very easy to vote early, on, early in person. It's very easy to vote on election day. It's very easy to vote by mail. And what they've seen in high turnout elections is in 2020, for instance, it was about a third each. Is that about right? Do I have that right? Yeah. About a third of each using early in person election day mail voting. In, um, in many elections in Georgia. And when you've got three different modes of voting like that, security actually increases. If you saw some kind of breach or problem, you would see a difference in one of those modes compared to the other two. Spreading out voting over various modes like that actually raises the actual security level. And so it's unfortunate that we're seeing disinformation cause voters to choose something that might not be as convenient or as right for them. Um, rather than choosing just the best me method of voting for them, whatever it is. Mark, panning out, um, you know, people on the right talk a lot about fraud. People on the left talk a lot about voter suppression. It, it would suggest from your presentation that neither narrative is true. Is that your opinion? Or what do you see as the reality versus the political rhetoric? No, thank well, I think in terms of fraud, we have very little evidence of any sort of orchestrated fraud. Uh, the United States, we have what you might call individual fraud, where that's where somebody votes for a relative or somebody gets access to a ballot. That happens on a very infrequent and pretty random basis, meaning neither candidate, no candidate benefits from it, and it's trivial in terms of its overall impact. What we really have not seen anywhere uh, is orchestrated uh, voter fraud outside of a few Democratic primaries, uh, maybe in South Texas, where, uh, where you can see some use of it by politiqueras in terms of mail ballot harvesting. But it's extremely rare. So fraud simply doesn't exist uh, in, in terms of any real noticeable impact. Voter suppression, there really is not much evidence of that as well uh, in terms of having a significant impact. It also seems it's very isolated. The survey results suggest that it's you know, minimal to in, in even terms of self-reported. Uh, and you know, we don't, since these aren't focus groups, we didn't go into great detail about what was actually implied by that. But overall, there also is not a major issue with voter suppression. And in large part, you know, a lot of areas, you know, the interesting part of voter suppression is that often the places you would say it might occur would be, say, a Harris County. Uh, but in Harris County, the elections are run by Democrats. Uh, and so, at, you know, at a certain level, neither voter suppression, no voter fraud is the significant problem that it's often played up. I think that's, a, and that'll be a subject of a, in the afternoon, that there are some other political incentives to, I think, play up the evidence, our existence of fraud and of suppression for both mobilization and fundraising goals. But the empirical evidence is that we don't have any noteworthy voter suppression in the United States, nor do we have any noteworthy voter fraud in the United States. 
Okay. Can, can we talk a bit more, Secretary Raffensperger, about um, states' efforts or discussions about leaving the uh, ERIC um, and what that means for um, what, like, what the solutions are and what the tensions are here between political rhetoric and then the reality of making sure that the voter rolls are, in fact, um, as thorough and up-to-date as possible? I think that what happened is there's a political pressure put on Republican secretaries of state. Uh, there's all this misinformation, disinformation out about Eric. And we're, we're kind of used to that in Georgia by now. And we just stand up and we push back on it. And so, can you briefly explain for people in here how exactly Eric works? Well, Eric uh, was put, to place, uh, put into place. Uh, probably uh, David Becker was one of the people that helped actually uh, begin that process of getting states to talk together. But what, what, what it is is a multi-state organization. The members of the board are each of the states that are members of it. So Texas would get one vote, Georgia gets one vote. And we actually had more Republican states that were members of ERIC until some of the Republican states pulled out. So if you don't really like what the rules are, you actually controlled the board, then you start making motions and see if someone would second, then have a discussion and say, well, let's change this here, let's change that there. That's how the legislative process works and that's how organizations should work. So in some respects, it's actually walking off the field of battle without putting up a fight. If you want to improve, Eric, then stay within an organization to reform it and, and further improve it. But it's a great organization because if you're a member of ERIC, say, for example, Virginia and Georgia, and you move to Virginia and you register in Virginia, Virginia notifies us. So then we can then contact that voter, and if they you know, respond back to us and say, yes, I moved to Virginia, we can take them off the voter rolls immediately. If they don't respond, we still don't remove them. What we do is we put them in this holding bin, knowing that they've moved there, but just because of some of the federal you know, restrictions that we have, we know we can't remove them immediately. But it just allows us to have objective criteria. And also, uh, we just think it allows us to keep up with a very dynamic mobility of our society. See, People always forget, when Pew did a study, they said 11% of all Americans move every year. We have 7.5 million voters. Multiply that by 0.11. That is 800,000 potential movements we have in a year. Now, they could be within the state or out of the state and all sorts of the movement, but that's a lot to keep up with. And what you want your counties to know is who actually still lives in my county, who actually lives in the precinct that they say that they live in, because we have precinct voting on Election Day. So for us, it's very important. But I think to have clean, accurate voter rolls is important for the integrity of the process, but also voters then can feel confident that these are actually Texans that are voting in Texas elections. You don't want Georgians voting in your elections, and I don't want Texans voting in ours. So it really helps that process. We want to make sure they're American citizens, but all the, the few requirements that we have. So how do you see the pushback against Eric playing out from here? Well, we have a few secretaries of state or lieutenant governors that are remaining in that are Republicans, and we want to build a consensus and really get the message out. But we've, we saw the first onslaught. Well, now it's really to push back, and we always like to push back with the truth. We always like to, the truth is always supported with facts, because they go hand in hand. Uh, misinformation and truth don't live together. And so that's really what we do, is we just continue to push back and get the message out. Because people, states will have dirtier voter rolls. So if a state like Alabama wants to pull out, I don't really care. Because what happens is more people from Alabama are moving to Georgia than vice versa. And so we're actually going to have cleaner rolls on a, on a proportional basis than they will. And we'll figure out if we have to have you know, bilateral agreements with state to state. And that's what we'll work on. But it's just unfortunate that you allow people that support it with no facts, just throw out these you know, uh, red herrings just to really disrupt you know, the social good. Uh, there's discussions in Austin also about potentially pulling out. How do you see this playing out in Texas politics, Mark well, or David? Well, yeah, big difference here is our Secretary of State is a appointee of the governor and approved by the Senate. Uh, so uh, former Senator Jane Nelson is our current Secretary of State. I think there's a lot of pressure, you know, for, uh, for our Texas to pull out. So I, I would expect that, you know, it's already in motion. And then yeah. in your opinion, what happens next? Well, I mean, what happens next is our elections become less trustworthy because when people move to other states, uh, we won't know that. So it's going to be more likely that you're going to have people remaining registered in Texas uh, while they live in Virginia or Georgia or 
Well, nobody moves to California, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Definitely nobody in this room. Yeah. Uh, but, for, for, but essentially, it's going, if you're concerned, I mean, the irony is that if you're concerned about fraud, and you're concerned about people being registered in two places, you would want to be part of Eric. And so the, we're going to, if we do pull out of Eric, then it's going to be um, make Texas elections less trustworthy uh, and more likely to have people voting who shouldn't be voting here. So it's a, basically a self-fulfilling prophecy that the people who have been talking about this, potentially even before it's been happening in a major way, are now making changes to the voting system that will make it less trustworthy and increase the prevalence of fraud. Yeah, I mean, it'll, and it actually will make mail voting the most untrustworthy because it's, that's easier to do from out of state. David, any thoughts on yeah, this? Yeah, I mean, I think you hit on it right there. We're seeing more and more efforts made under the auspices of election integrity used to dismantle the infrastructure of actual election integrity. Eric is a good example of that. You know, Eric, one of the things that election officials, if you talk to any of them, they all want clean voter rolls. Clean voter rolls is not about taking people off. It's not about putting people on. It's making sure that it accurately reflects the people who are eligible to vote in your electorate. And often that voter list maintenance is enfranchising because most of the moves that occur are in state. So if election officials are contacting someone in a state who's on the list, but they no longer live in that place, they're not getting the information they need about elections that are relevant to them. They might go to the wrong polling place. That might create lines. That might create more provisional ballots lead to longer times to report results. All of these things amplify disinformation, can create more distrust in the process. And again, when election officials formed the election, uh, Electronic Registration Information Center in 2012, and I helped them do that, they were seeking to fix this problem. Because one of the things we don't have in this country is a magic list. We don't have a magic list of everybody exactly where they put their head at night at any given moment in time. We don't have it. We, ha we don't even have, up until 2006, we didn't have 50 lists like that. We had 10,000 lists like that. And every federal election, as people in Texas definitely know, are not one federal election. There are 10,000 little elections going on all over the country. There are 254 elections here in Texas happening. And so being able to identify when Maria Gonzalez or John Lee or Sean O'Hara, or Mark Jones, in another place who has gotten a driver's license or registered to vote, is the same one who just moved from the place you're living in? That's really hard. And Eric does that really well. So Eric's telling states when, oh, the Mark Jones you have on your list is someone who actually um, moved to this other state. And we know it because they just got a driver's license in that other state. That was, real, that was never done before. So imagine now states who are leaving no longer have access to any of that information. They no longer have access to information about someone who might have sent in a mail ballot in one state and also voted in their, in their state. They're no longer getting that. States like Georgia and Texas, at least for the moment, still are. And that's increasing their election integrity. And so when we see things like efforts to delegitimize Eric or efforts to push for things like human hand counting of ballots rather than machine counts with legitimate hand audits of those ballots, those all reduce the election integrity overall and lead to a greater chance of chaos and distrust post-election being leveraged by election losers. Could I ask you all about something that's been in the news recently, which is the Dominion and Fox settlements? We saw this 800, nearly $800 million settlement um, with Dominion voting systems, which had been criticized by Tucker Carlson and others for um, being unreliable and yielding false results. Um, how does this settlement play into public trust? So has all the damage been done and $800 million kind of sweetens Dominion's life but doesn't really restore public trust? Or do you think that it will have a positive impact on the narrative around an election integrity? And I know Georgia uses Dominion voting systems, so I'd love to hear your perspective, Secretary. Well, I think I feel like I'm grinning like a Cheshire cat over that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you said sweeten, you know, their life, well, it sweetened our life, too. I, I'm going to, you know, channel Jackie Gleason when he used to come out at the end of the show and say how sweet it is, right? Mm -hmm. Because what it was was vindication. It was vindication for the state of Georgia. Because, number one, we pushed back. We did a 100% hand recount. We also, at the same time, when we knew that the election machines were being questioned, 
We then did a forensic audit of a select set. You know, we had an organization in Huntsville, Alabama that does scientific, you know, uh, forensic audits of those machines that proved the machines, you know, were not flipping votes. It was all made up stuff, but it took two and a half years. We had, you know, all the things that had happened, all the social disruptions. Our, our, our nation's fabric was basically torn apart because people that couldn't accept the fact that they lost. And what's really upsetting to me is that reports have come out that the, the day before that I had my conversation with the president, he received a report from uh, Berkeley Research, which is out in Washington Post, was reported. They paid $600,000 for that report, and they said, you lost. They, he paid, his campaign paid for this report to investigate all these allegations that came up, he came up short. But we know in Georgia what happened, the machines were accurate, but in Georgia what happened is that 24,000 Georgians skipped the presidential race. They left the top of the ticket blank. They said, I couldn't vote for this person, this person, or this person, but they said, I'll vote down ballot. And that's where we saw the, collectively that our Republican congressmen got 33,000 more votes than President Trump. Typically our state reps and state senators got about five to 6% higher vote totals than President Trump. But we've been pushing back. And so eventually, you know, when you have your day in court, and they never got their day, so to speak, but they had findings of fact before that, that are now established with these findings of fact, the machines accurately recorded the election. And then I guess there was some fallout based on that, you know, and maybe hopefully, you know, some of these networks will figure out if you want to have, you know, you know, fair and balanced, that you want to make sure that you truly do have fair and balance, and it's based on the facts. And so I'm really grateful to, you know, the working of the court. Thanks. Does this, when it comes to the public imagination, do you think that ultimately this has helped resolve things and steer people toward the facts? Or do you think that people will retain the facts they entered 2023 with and the settlement will do little to well, change their view? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of the equivalent of, say, having a headline <clears throat> one day that's completely wrong and false. And then a week later on page 18 under the tide schedules posting, oh, we were wrong. Uh, it, you know, so there were, you know, we experienced two years of this constant misinformation that was repeated as fact for so long. Well, it helps that we have the vindication. This is showing that it was all false, but that's not going to erase two years. And a lot, a lot of people are just simply not going to tune into this resolution of this settlement. They're just going to remember there was something about the machines that was fault, you know, corrupt. Okay. Um, one thing that contributes to perceptions of fraud is how in certain very important uh, swing states, it takes so long to tally votes. And Mark, you had that great slide showing which states have which system and the variation, but we see in Michigan and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, despite America's lead in technology and being able to do so many things, including, you know, start chat, chat GPT, yeah. it seems like they can't count votes in any timely manner whatsoever. Are we going to see those states change their laws in any way, or will this continue as the norm? So first of all, I, I, th I think we have to recognize a very fundamental fact. We have never counted ballots immediately, ever. In American history, Mark has that great data on how long ballots are in Texas, particularly here in Harris, Harris County. We have the most complex ballots in the world and the most decentralized system. And when elections are really close, there are always, in every single jurisdiction across the country, going to be ballots that take extra time to verify and validate. That's good that we're taking the time to do it. Every place has something called provisional ballots or something like that, where we're not sure if that person was eligible to vote, vote. They got to check them. We got to check signatures on mail ballots. That is always going to take time. There was a tweet put out by a chief election official, and I won't mention who, it's no one in this room, um, criticizing Arizona for how long it was taking them to count ballots. Um, that state was at that same moment still counting hundreds of thousands of ballots. Arizona finished counting their ballots before this state finished counting their ballots. What was the big difference? Margin of victory. If the margin of victory is hundreds of thousands or millions of ballots, you don't need to get to the end of counting all of the ballots in every state, which takes weeks, by the way. Certification comes weeks after the election because you want to verify and validate and audit before certifying. And so this is the status quo. This has always been the status quo. And when there are really close elections, 
it's going to take a long time, and we just should be used to that. And recognize that the men and women, the professionals and the volunteers who are working in election offices over night, 24 hours a day in most cases, are working their best to get this done. People were criticizing Philadelphia in 2020. They were literally staffing it around the clock in several other places all over the country. That was happening. Um, so a lot of this concern about how long it takes to count ballots is a myth. And ask yourself if California had a close race where the Democrat won, that, I know that might be hard to believe that it'd be a close race where the Democrat won a statewide race in a state like California, but it could happen and it has had happened in the past. And they announced the final results at 8.15 p.m., 15 minutes after closing. What would the same purveyors of disinformation say about California in that case? They'd say, oh, the fix is in, they counted them too fast. This is all about delegitimizing elections by the losers. It isn't, doesn't really relate to any reality of what's it reasonable to expect when you're counting multi-page ballots in 10,000 different jurisdictions as quickly as you possibly can. And it's okay to expect results right away. We all expect results right away. We all wanna know who won. I want to, and I've been doing this for 25 years. But we also have to recognize in close elections it's gonna take some time. And we should do our best to count the ballots as quickly as possible. But there are going to be states where there are no races. I'm sorry, a 10,000 vote margin is a landslide when it comes to recount law. But it may, might take a several days till you can get to the point where you can say a 10,000 vote margin is likely to be where this ends. And we're seeing more and more state elections like that. Secretary Raffensperger, did you want to add? I would, would add that uh, we saw in the 2020 election, uh, we are historically we have about five to six percent of absentee voting and we're back to that number and what we're really seeing is about probably 70 percent of people are voting early but what we did with the sb 202 we put into place the requirement that all counties because counties run elections if it's not in state law you can't tell them what to do so you then put into state law then they have to follow the law and that is that they have to pre-scan the absentee ballots in other words they have to do pre-processing so if you received an absentee ballot early you look at it, verify it, separate the envelope with the ballots, lay them flat, all ready to go. Then you can run them through the scanners. You scan, but you do not tabulate. But since it's all been scanned, then you can then press the magic button for tabulation at 701 so to report those results quicker. So what you really then are, are actually counting of the absentee ballots that take time are the ones that re received uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, before the election, because you probably haven't had a chance to do those ones since you get ready for the election day process. So we think that gets you the results quicker. Also with SB 202, we had a, a 1030 cutoff. We changed that now to 1159 cutoff, that we have to know how many outstanding ballots left do we have to count. We don't know who, if they're voting for party A, B, or C, but we do know that this is how many ballots. We think that also gives voters confidence in the process. So we're trying to shore up confidence, but at the end of the day, you're gonna have a winner and you're gonna have a loser. And I understand how polarized this country is. I live in Georgia. I knew how polarized it was. We had Stacey Abrams lose an election by 55,000 votes, but that just didn't get some people's attention in the Republican Party. They still thought that this was a solid 60-40 state. No, it's a very competitive state. So we want to make sure that we have you know, safe, sure, secure elections, but at the end of the day, we are going to have a winner, we're going to have a loser, and at the end of the day, you need to be able to accept your loss. There's only one team that wins the Super Bowl. There's only one team that wins the college national championship. That's UGA two years in a row. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and, the, and, as long as, and as long as the losers move on, they can come back next year and try again. I, I think, for Alexander, I think one thing that the Secretary alluded to is there are some things that can probably be done with absentee ballots in terms of trying to coax some of the states that say allow ballots to arrive a week after, a uh, you know, longer period of time to ha push those deadlines up as well as get the counting done before. Some states prohibit the counting from occurring until election day. So there are some things that can be done to get some of those votes counted quicker, uh, but you're still not in a very close race. You're still going to have to wait. Yeah, I, yeah, I'll just add very briefly that this is a good point from both of you where um, there are two very important large swing states 
where the election officials are prohibited from pre-processing mail ballots, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. And so imagine you've got this, these mail ballots that have come in, they've been secured for a period of time, but you're not even allowed to start reviewing signatures and confirming that they're valid votes until election day. That is going to take some time. In Pennsylvania, it took some time in 2020, same with Wisconsin. And, and that so, would have to change with the state legislatures, right? right. They would uh, have to change the laws. And there's resistance in the state legislature, in some cases from the very same people who are complaining about how long it takes to count ballots. So um, now, on the other hand, there are a lot of states, and these are not politically um, uh, monolithic states. There are deeply red and deeply blue states that take on the same process that Georgia does, which is when you get a ballot in, at some point before the election, you begin validating signatures, you confirm the ballots, you place them in the tabulators so that once the polls are closed, you can begin the tabulations and report them out, and it's a very good process. Okay. Um, you'll notice, uh, I, I have a few more questions for you, but I also want to include yours. So you'll notice in the center of your tables there are note cards, and then someone will be circulating and bring them. So please do write out your questions and raise your hand if you want yours picked up. Um, I'd like to ask you about the future. Um, as if the past hasn't been depressing enough. But tell us, should we be optimistic about 2024 and what's ahead when it comes to elections? Should we be concerned? W was 2020 prelude for what we're likely to see again, especially if it's a rematch between Biden and Trump, as is looking increasingly likely? Secretary Raffensperger, what's your prediction? I don't have the gift of prophecy, mm -hmm. and so what I have to do is just go out and meet and talk, pe talk with people. And so I've never doubted the common sense of anyone that you meet in America, no matter where it is. You know, um, you can go from a rural area to a rural area, to, no matter what part of the state it is, and urban is urban, if that makes sense, suburb is, is suburbs. But I think that people are basically good. I think really the, the core issue that we have, you know, in America, is that my party right now, if they would go back and buy a book by Peggy Noonan called Ronald Reagan, When Character Was King, you know, that's the way back. And that's really what I talk about in the end of my book. I don't have any great policy prescriptions because if we don't fix character, we don't fix integrity, the ability to engage in civil discourse, even with people on the other side of the aisle, to try and find some common ground to get as much as what you can get done. Because President Ronald Reagan did have to negotiate with Tip O'Neill. And when I was a young person, I just never understood that sometimes. You know, I wanted it our way. President Reagan, why are you doing that? Because he understood that he has to work with both sides of the aisle. And he just had the, the character and he had the confidence. He had the confidence, not just in himself, but he had it in all of us. And people need to have more confidence in the American people. Because what they're selling right now, some people with all their misinformation, disinformation, they don't have confidence in the American people. Because if they lean in the, in the American people's common sense, they're going to do well. Because the American people are going to figure it out. They're going to sniff it out. And what they're looking for is someone that has character, has integrity. And we've had some great uh, Republican presidents in the last 50 years that have led our nation. But if you really look what you boil it all down, it started with the, the building block of character and integrity. You may have disagreed with people's actual policies, but you never questioned their integrity. Do you, do you have um, do, do you have confidence in the integrity of election administrators on the state level to not politicize outcomes in 2024? By and large, I do. I understand that uh, when we have the National Association of Secretary of State, we have some that are very liberal. We have some that are, that are very conservative and they have rhetorical flourishes. But that said, their job is to follow the law, follow the Constitution. And if they want to not follow the law, then they'll be met in state court or federal court. And there they will be required to follow the law. And I want to give you some great hope about the county election directors. They swear an oath to the Constitution of the United States of America and into their state to follow the law. And so I believe that most of them will. We've seen a few you know, rogue counties already try that and they got shut down pretty quick. I don't know if that would have to get bumped up to a federal court, but you know, we will make sure that we have fair and honest elections for everyone. You know, candidates have to run. They maybe need to pick better consultants, they need to really message better. 
and they need to talk in people's good ear. You know, don't keep on beating people up with anger and you know negative you know comments. I don't think people really were looking for that. I think people are looking for positive solutions. They're looking for someone that's actually truly looking at what is going to make my life better. Tabletop issues, kitchen table issues. So that's where I am with America, because they just reelected me, my fellow Georgians, and I leaned into those people. And I knew that, you know, if I could get my message out, that they would understand, and they would then challenge me, ask me questions like they're going to do here today. But uh, at the end of the day, the truth would win. So is your opinion that 2024 will go smoothly? 2024? Uh, I think that, uh, I think that there'll be a winner and there'll be a loser. <laughs> <laughs> um, any, any, anything further? And then, uh, as a Republican, that I hope that our party moves forward. And I know that we can move forward with the right person at the helm. I think that's, that's a big, that's probably the biggest question is who the Republican nominee is. Uh, if it's Donald Trump again, it's tough to imagine things getting too much better just because the same incentives, the same playbook would be followed. What about Ron DeSantis? I mean, he leads most closely in the polls, although very far behind Trump. Can't be worse. Uh, probably better. <laughs> Talk about an optimist. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think, I think where, where I do have confidence is in the, again, the hundreds of thousands of professional election administrators all over the country who do a really hard job, who I think are, a lot of people are learning what they do. They don't show up on the Monday before an election and clear out the gym and set things up. They're working every single day. They're working today as we're talking. But they've been under unprecedented harassment and abuse and threats for years now. We are almost a 1,000 days from the 2020 election, and it has not let up. It is ramping up. And we are seeing somewhere in the range, and Avery mentioned this in her, in her remarks as well, somewhere in the range of 20 to 30 to 40 percent of election officials in some places leaving. They're asking themselves, why do I do this civil service job where my best case scenario on the Wednesday after election is anonymity? Nobody is, there's no headline on the Wednesday after an election, everything went great, right? You only hear about these people when something has gone wrong. And now their best case scenario is still anonymity. Their worst case scenario is they're being followed home by work, followed, followed home from work by people in cars. They are getting disgusting threats on their cell phones. Um, it's really rough on them. This has happened in Texas. It happened recently. You've lost some really good election administrators here in Texas because of the ongoing abuse. And after the 2022 election, I think a lot of us probably got a little more cautiously optimistic because in every contested election, those who were actively spreading disinformation about elections lost, every single one of them, including elections where candidates who had embraced truth and reality and acted with principles and integrity, as Secretary Raffensperger pointed out, they would have easily won some of those elections. Um, and there was a moment of hope there, to be perfectly honest. I don't want to be a downer here, but since that time, in the six months since then, rather than responding to the political incentives that you would expect, um, we lost these elections, let's find candidates that won't lose us elections in the future. That'd be a good idea. They've actually doubled down, in many cases, on continued election denialism and disinformation. And as states have harmed their own election integrity by leaving Eric, as counties are getting rid of voting systems, Shasta County, California, getting rid of a Dominion voting system for no reason whatsoever, and moving towards a less accurate, more costly, more time-consuming hand-counting system. These things are going on today. And so the question I ask myself is, are the election officials going to be there to do this job? Are they adequately supported? Do they have adequate resources? And what happens in 2024 if the losing candidate gives one of Secretary Raffensperger's colleagues that same call? I know what Brad will do. He's faced that test. Um, but I think we have questions to ask about that. And it gives me significant concern heading into 2024. So basically, everyone needs to have a tape recorder handy when they, when they get a phone call. 
Um, can I ask you, I mean, it's been the economist's view that the politicization of election administration is a massive threat and the election of election deniers um, poses a real threat to the, um, viability, the smooth viability of the 2024 election. David, I mean, you alluded to it, but what is your prediction on whether this will go smoothly? So I think, um, I think there are two possible threats, one I'm less concerned about and one I'm more concerned about. Um, a lot of times we talk about election subversion and the chance that the, uh, the loser of an election could be anointed the winner. I'm not so concerned about that. It's not entirely impossible, but the courts have largely held. They've largely held plaintiffs challenging candidates to a standard of evidence, which is appropriate. Um, the, uh, I think the courts have acted responsibly, both in pre- and post-election litigation. Whether you like all of their decisions or not, I think they're acting to try to um, keep the guardrails of democracy there. Um, we see such a level of uh, disinformation-driven anger in the post-election period that I'm worried about the second problem, which is the risk of political violence. And that is, again, not hypothetical. We saw it on January 6th. Um, I think it's one reason that everybody in the country, not just the, not just the Republican Party, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, everybody, we need to do better at trying to turn down some of the heat. 74 million people voted for Donald Trump in 2020. They are not insurrectionists. They are not all insurrectionists. They were sincerely disappointed by the outcome of the 2020 election. They preferred their candidate. And that's understandable. Who in this room hasn't experienced an electoral disappointment at some point in the last 10 years? That happens. That's how elections work. As Brad said, there are winners and losers. Um, but we need to find ways to um, turn the heat down a little bit across the political spectrum and accept that sometimes our candidates lose, sometimes our candidates win. This is not civil warfare on an ongoing basis. This is how democracies work. Thank you. I'd love to hear your questions also. Would you like? With that happy thought, David, <laughs> I'd like to note that, uh, Dave, that uh, Major Garrett is wearing some Dia de los Muertos socks with Skull's head on them, so he came prepared today. I had the same question asked by five people, so I'm going to go with what, what the viewers want, and essentially is this one. Do you believe the rejection of Eric by some states is mainly a function of partisanship slash culture war or the requirement to reach out to eligible but unregistered voters? Oh, I would love to take this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the requirement to reach out to eligible but unregistered voters existed since Eric's formation in June of 2012. Every state that joined Eric joined it voluntarily. There is no congressional act that says you must join Eric. Eric was designed to be a voluntary organization. Up at its, at its peak, it had about 33 states. It still has over half the states and over half the voters in the United States are, are in states that are in Eric. Um, that requirement existed in 2012. It existed in 2020. It existed in 2021, it still exists today. Every state that joined knew of that requirement. Florida, their first mailing was a huge mailing in 2020, Texas as well, done voluntarily, knowing in advance that was going to happen. If they'd had a problem with that, they could have tried to change it through the process, and they did ultimately, but only after disinformation started. It was largely a politically driven thing. It wasn't, there weren't actual problems, and in fact, in, in, in some cases, you will hear that there were concerns about um, not using Eric adequately for list maintenance. And actually, one of the amendments that these same states who ultimately withdrew proposed was to make list maintenance using Eric completely optional. So I think you know, it's unfortunate that, um, again, Secretary Raffensperger already alluded to this, that some succumb to the disinformation rather than pushing back against it because um, it's going to harm their own voter list and it's ultimately going to harm their voters because they're going to go to the wrong place potentially because their voter record might not be up to date. Um, but no nothing has changed significantly in Eric and they all knew what the process was to change Eric's bylaws and membership agreement. And when you hear a state that wasn't Eric criticize Eric, they're criticizing themselves. Eric was run by the states. Um, I sat on the board for a period of time. I was a non-voting member. I couldn't vote. I couldn't make a motion. I couldn't even renominate myself to be a non-voting member again if I'd wanted to. Um, uh, I, I, if anyone has ever served as a non-voting member of a board, you know you get the great privilege of attending meetings, which is <laughs> lovely. 
Um, but uh, it's entirely politically driven, unfortunately. And, hope, and, I, and what I hope is after this, after some of this fever has broken, that states will recognize that and hopefully come back to Eric. There's no, there's no penalty for leaving Eric. There's no reason states can't, can't rejoin if they have, and hopefully they will. Mark, this one's for you, but I think it's open for everybody else. Can you address the question of how states such as Washington use, that use only mail-in ballots trust the process? And is there a pushback from some voters who are wary of it? Well, I mean, I, so it's the same sort of type of system. You, the belief in, in the Washington or all mail ballot systems is that the mail ballot process is secure. Uh, yeah, at one level, there's sort of an existential or philosophical approach that you're going to err on the side of making it easier to vote at the potential risk of making it a little easier for potential fraud by mailing by using an all mail ballot system. Thus far, though, the, you know, the, our system's pretty good at catching fraud when it exists, especially if anything approaching orchestrated fraud. It's extremely rare, but when it does occur, it gets caught. So the Washington system has been uh, you know, studied quite expansively, Oregon the same, Colorado. Uh, if you like Paul Gronke, a former uh, graduate student, our colleague of mine at Michigan long, long ago, who's our softball coach. Uh, <laughs> but you know, Paul's done a lot, they've, they've done a lot of work on that and they've never found any issue of fraud. So I think you know, it's, it's one of those things with mail ballot, the, the way that they do when you have all mail ballot systems and you mail ballots out to everyone, there is the potential for, for some fraud, uh, particularly the sort of individual fraud, that is a spouse voting for another for a spouse or a, a father voting for a child. But there, the orchestrated fraud, we simply haven't seen it. And in our current system of phones and technology, uh, anything that would start to occur on the broader scale would be pretty easily detectable. So I don't think there's a lot of concern. I'm not the biggest fan of mail voting. I would prefer people, if they can, to vote in person. Uh, but I think it's helpful to have the mail ballot option for those who need it. Well, what I'd say about uh, Washington State specifically is the former Secretary of State was Republican and had come up through the county election uh, offices and then became Secretary of State, and that's Kim Wyman. And she uh, really just made sure that they had the process in place for whatever the results were. And she was the only Republican that was ever elected, you know, statewide. So I think when you're in a state that does lean, you know, hard the other side, uh, the other party can still be elected in those states in that case, but it gets down to honesty and, and competence. And she ran that office well. Also point out that Utah is a mail-in uh, mail state also, and that has Republican governor, Republican lieutenant governor who oversees elections there. And they both uh, have done well, and I think voters in no, that state have high confidence levels in in the process of voting in Utah. Yeah, and I, I mean, just the mail ballot aspect is something that's just recent. It's Republicans eight years ago had no issue with mail ballots. Mm -hmm. It's simply it's a Donald Trump oriented phenomena, uh, and in states where there's I think more confidence and less, I guess where there's there's a I guess less. Uh, there's less of a need by many politicians to anchor themselves to Trump in the same way and to follow the talking points of the former president. And Utah is a good example of that. Utah Republicans, I think, are self-confident enough that they don't need to do that, by and large. Uh, we don't tend to see that sort of immediately following the narrative created by former President Trump that most Republicans know is not necessarily, which is false. For any of you, or all of you, what is ballot har harvesting? What is the problems with it? And what can be done to prevent it? So it, ballot harvesting is a term, I think it'd be fair to call it, it was kind of a pejorative term used to describe the process by which an individual would return more than their own mail ballot to some either a drop box or to the election office or even by mail. So basically, you're returning, um, you're, you're collecting ballots from others and returning them. Um, in a vast majority of cases of so-called ballot harvesting, it is someone collecting a ballot from family members and returning them. That's very convenient. In, in most states, that's legal um, and entirely appropriate. Um, very rarely do you see circumstances where someone, and this is a, against the law in most places, is collecting you know, hundreds of ballots and, and returning them. I know this is very relevant to some allegations that were made in Georgia in, in 2020. Um, these allegations have been widely debunked. They have not 
in, in, they have not impacted elections to any degree. Um, and most importantly, even if there was, this is kind of inherent to a lot of the disinformation around elections. Let's say someone did illegally return a few more ballots than they were supposed to return. That's against the law. That person should be prosecuted if that's the case. Um, but is the remedy for that that otherwise eligible ballots get thrown out, cast by regular voters? This is actually, remember a lot of the lawsuits in 2020 literally sought to throw out, in some cases, millions of ballots because there was an alleged administrative deficiency. Now, that administrative deficiency usually fell apart. It usually didn't exist. But even if it did, is the result that millions of ballots get thrown out? Do the voters pay the price for that administrative deficiency? And this is one of the problems with kind of the whole ballot harvesting debate. We don't see it really happening on any level. This allegation that's been happening on millions has been completely and wildly debunked. Um, but uh, documentary makers, uh, documentary in quotes, have made a lot of money off of that at $30 a pop. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily a problem. And I think lawmakers in the states have largely handled it pretty well and decided what's an appropriate um, number of ballots for someone to return and who may they return them for. Yeah, I mean, it's rare. I mean, it's rare. In Texas, it exists, but it's extremely rare. Uh, it, as I mentioned earlier, down in the Valley, we do have a, some you know, cases, but we're talking 50 ballots, 40 ballots. It's usually uh, a, a person, a politiquera, going to a lower income retirement community and harvesting the ballots of uh, the individuals who live there or for, of neighbors. Uh, but it's an extremely rare event. And when it, the only time that it really ever could have an effect is in an extremely low turnout election, which is often a Democratic primary. I think the Harris County case I can remember, I think someone running against Harold Dutton uh, was a state rep. There was some accusations that there was some ballot harvesting just because of the nature of some ballots. But we're talking 30 or 40 ballots, not something that was changing the outcome. And with House Bill 316, which we uh, passed when I took office in 2019, got us new voting machines, ability to join Eric, and also we outlawed ballot harvesting. And we modeled our law word for word after Arizona since it was going through the court system. And Arizona's law for uh, stopping ballot harvesting has it been upheld by the Supreme Court. Uh, Florida has their laws similar to Arizona's. But we believe that the only person that should touch the ballot is the voter themselves or a close family member or a you know, a health care provider, you know, for someone that has some disability. But we just really believe that that uh, it shores up security. And also we want to have people have confidence in the process that you don't have, you know, someone that's going through the town that's collecting all these thousands and thousands of ballots, that those are truly the people's ballots. So I look at that as a security measure, but it's also a confidence builder. And I think that's one of the things, uh, right or wrong, it's where we are. Uh, we need to restore confidence wherever we can without making sure we don't preclude ability, people's voters for accessibility. So it's accessibility with security and balancing those two so we elevate confidence in the process. One last question, open to everybody. Alexander, feel, please feel free to answer this one if you'd like to. What are your opinions on the Electoral College versus electing the president by popular vote? <laughs> I support the Electoral College. I think that what it was designed by founders, and I think that they talk in so many of the documents about divine providence and things like that. I just think that it was uh, a document made for the people at that time, and it could be changed over time. And I think that the Constitution is very clear at the Electoral College. It makes sure that it really does it ensures that every state gets a voice. That means that campaigns can't just go and campaign in the top 20 cities. So you just park yourself out in Houston, Dallas, you know, and pick the, all the other top 20 cities and just, you know, get all the you know, real strong vote totals. No, you have to actually go to places like New Hampshire, Iowa, and, and South Carolina, the mm -hmm. smaller states. And I think that really helps. That means that the president then is not just the president of these few big cities or few big cities. He's the president of all of America. So it really is your hope is that when a president does take office, he understands that he has just gotten 50.2, 50.5%. He doesn't have 80% of the vote, but he understands he's the president of all of America. And then he continues to work on trying to build a broad based coalition for his first term so that he could be reelected his second term. Mm -hmm.
Uh, I just will make two points. Uh, one, uh, we are the only country, our only democracy in the world after Argentina reformed its constitution in 1994 to still use the Electoral College, so we're an outlier. Uh, the second is, uh, as Secretary Baker, I think, would say, uh, given the need for two-thirds vote in the House and Senate and three-quarters of the states, it's never going to happen, so we shouldn't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kind of feel, I, I feel about the Electoral College like I feel about um, my opinion on gravity. It, we've got, it, it's, it's here, we've got it. Um, I don't think there's much use in trying to uh, change it. Um, I, think it's, I think it's very resistant to change. I think there are some very good arguments for getting rid of it with the current way politics is nationalized as opposed to when the Constitution was originally written. Um, but there's, there's also legitimate arguments in favor of it that go beyond election outcomes, such as, can you imagine, I mean, we, we, we often forget about the 2000 election now, which is hilarious, because that's all we talked about up until 2020. But um, the national popular vote was very, very close that year. Was, I think about 500,000 votes separating the candidates nationally. And if a 500,000 vote margin, when you're talking about you know, 120 million votes overall. That's a, that's, that's a fairly narrow margin. And if we were in that situation, imagine if we didn't have recounts in just six swing states, but we had recounts in 8,000, 10,000 local jurisdictions all over the country and the uncertainty that might result. So I think there's, there's good arguments on both sides, but I'm, I'm with Mark, it's not changing. <laughs> Um, do you mind if I ask one more question? I, uh, my answer to it, it was, is that this is like in the realm of dinner party games. It's kind of fun to talk about, but we have issues like whether or not we can agree on an election outcome. So it feels like a far-fetched thing to discuss the Electoral College. Um, my question for you is we've, we focused a lot on the enemy within about you know people who are potentially voting illegitimately and alike. Back to 2016, we were concerned about foreign election interference, and again, distant memory, just like 2000. But I just briefly, we're out of time, but I'd really love to hear your opinions on the security and safety um, of voting systems as it relates to foreign interference. And are you getting briefings, and is this a concern in the run up to 24? It's, that's the one issue that will keep a Secretary of State up at night because you don't know where the threat's gonna come from. Is it internal, external? What that, could that be? And so we have really worked hard with you know, national you know, uh, agencies to shore up that security. And if you, if you came to our meetings for the National Association of Secretary of State, we'll always have several people come in and talk about cybersecurity. So that is really front and center, or actually it's not front and center, it's behind the wall. So we wanna have, you know, maybe we know that we can protect ourselves as best we can, but we never wanna get out there and say, oh, this is, you know, it never could happen here because you have counties or other state agencies get hacked all the time. So we understand, you know, all those threat vectors out there. And so that's why we're continuing to try to build in redundancy and protections against cyber threats. But when you have a verifiable paper ballot and you can do a 100% hand recount, that ballot will actually say, who did you want for? Did you want Joe, Mary, or someone else? And that you can actually do a hand recount. There's where the ultimate security can be in audits and recounts. We, we focus a lot on the voting systems themselves. That's where a lot of the disinformation comes from. But we've made so much progress in 2016 about uh, 20 to 25 percent of all ballots in this country, including all of those in Georgia, were digital. There was no paper record. There was that was two decades. That was when Brad came into office, by the way. And then, over the course of the next year, Brad and his team in the legislature moved towards all paper ballots in Georgia. Can you imagine in Georgia if they didn't have paper ballots in 2020? How disinformation would have reigned? And we are now at a point where 95 percent of all ballots in this country are paper. They are voter verifiable, they are auditable, and in almost every single case they are audited. And the only cases with, uh, the only states with significant number of non-paper ballots are non-swing uh, states, Texas being the largest of them, Mississippi, Tennessee, uh, the largest blue state, and they're moving away from it is New Jersey. So we've largely done that very well, but the one area where there, where there actually have been breaches is in voter registration systems. That was in 2016. Um, the Illinois statewide voter registration system was breached for a period of time by, um, it's been concluded that by actors related to the Russian GRU. Um, and they sat very quietly in that system for three weeks doing virtually nothing. And then they all of a sudden ramped up their activity to really, really very high levels. And the question became, why did they do that? Because they were discovered immediately once they did that. They shut every, Illinois shut everything down, cleaned up their system and, 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 shut, and shut it off from the outside world. 
And the reason is because they wanted to be discovered. They were upset they weren't getting discovered because the real goal isn't to actually go in there and change ballots or to change voter rolls. It is to get us to all doubt our fellow citizens, the people who are running elections and election outcomes. So they wanted the narrative to be that Russia had gotten into the Illinois statewide voter registration database. Were we really going to be surprised when Illinois went blue in 2016? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so this is, this is something that's an ongoing concern, but there have been, uh, Brad alluded to it, there have been a huge number of improvements since then. Mm -hmm. My organization puts out reports on voter registration database security, great coordination between the federal government, the state governments, and all of the local governments within the states that is um, light years ahead of where we were in 2016. Yeah, I mean, I agree on, particularly on like 2016, I always view the goal of the Russians not to elect Donald Trump, but to reduce the legitimacy of Hillary Clinton's victory. I mean, I don't think the Russians knew more about U.S. politics than pretty much anyone else. Uh, they weren't backing a winner. They just wanted to muddy the results such that they could, it would lead to doubting her uh, presidency and thus undermining her ability to be effective. Very good. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you very much. You. There is lunch outside. Please grab a lunch and come back in and, and uh, get ready for the next event, the discussion of President Carter. Thank you. Thank you so much.
President Robinson, John Williams, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Thank Welcome you. to Houston via the internet. Good. If, if we're just about ready to go, if you'll give us about five minutes, we'll get sure, everybody no assembled problem. and we will get the in, uh, interview started. Great. Thank you so much, ma'am. Pleasure. All right, everyone. We hope that you have been enjoying your lunch. Um, if you haven't already gotten your lunch, please go out and grab a box lunch. They are delicious. We are going to start our lunchtime conversation now, which is entitled A Legacy of President Jimmy Carter, Free and Fair Elections Around the World. Among the many legacies of President Jimmy Carter, his support of credible and open elections at home and abroad provides a reminder of his dedication to democracy and the way the public officials are voted into office. After leaving the White House, President Carter participated and led 39 of the more than 100 international election observation missions of the Carter Center. He played key roles in assisting democratic transitions in countries including Nicaragua, Panama, Guyana, Indonesia, Nepal, Liberia, Zambia, and many others. And of course, as we've already talked about a little bit today, he played a defining role in shaping US elections in the United States when he and former Secretary of State James Baker co-chaired the Commission on Federal Election Reform. This conversation is going to really reflect on President Carter's contributions to democracy, both in the United States and around the world. We have a really exciting panel um, of folks who have worked with President Carter in international election observation, in his many other sort of post-presidency uh, diplomatic roles like the elders, and, and, and we're joined by Mr. Alter, who just knows so much about, about President Carter. This, this conversation will be moderated by Major Garrett, the Chief White House Correspondent of CBS News. We'll hear from Jonathan Alter, journalist and author of His Very Best, Jimmy Carter, A Life, David Carroll, the Director of the Democracy Program at the Carter Center, and Her Excellency Mary Robinson, former President of Ireland. Major, over to you. Avery, thank you so much. It's always great to be back in Houston and wonderful to be at the Baker Institute. I'm glad to see all of you here. John, thank you as always for inviting me. I always appreciate the invitation and I make it here whenever I can. Um, let's just get right down to it. Uh, we had a conversation in the morning about the fragility of American democracy. One of the things that President Carter wanted to do as president and did after his presidency was expand the viability and resilience of democracy outside of the United States. And I want to start there with Jonathan talking about something that Jimmy Carter, as a young political figure in Georgia, experienced. We had a conversation this morning about a term called ballot harvesting. Uh, Jonathan, tell us about Jimmy Carter's young political life and his experience with ballot stuffing in Sumter <laughs> County, Georgia. Um, so uh, Jimmy Carter um, was born and, ra and raised uh, in and then just outside Plains, Georgia, population 650 in Sumter County, southwest Georgia. 
And he goes off to the Naval Academy and is in the Navy for 10 years working on this very elite program with Admiral Rickover. And when his father dies, he comes back home and assumes all of his father's civic uh, responsibilities. And among those was that his father, shortly before his death, had been elected to the Georgia, uh, uh, elected as a Georgia state representative. So after a few years home building his business, rescuing his father's uh, peanut warehouse business and engaging in other civic activities, uh, Carter decides in 1962 to run for the Georgia State Senate. Um, and um, the election is quite literally, no exaggeration, stolen from him by a corrupt uh, local county boss um, who quite literally, no exaggeration, stuffs the ballot box with phony uh, paper ballots made out in the name of Carter's opponent. And uh, Carter, um, this guy was like almost comic villain, the kind of guy who wore sunglasses indoors. His name was Joe Hurst. And um, um, corrupt in many different ways. And Carter ended up taking the case to court. And he hired uh, a... Uh, an attorney um, named Charlie Kerbo, who became his close friend and major political advisor, even though he never worked in the White House um, when Carter was president, uh, a country lawyer who worked for um, King and Spalding, big Atlanta law firm. And with Kerbo's help, um, Carter fought back in court and won and was eventually, after a lot of uh, twists and turns, um, it took his seat in the Georgia State Senate. And then, <clears throat> um, believing that uh, revenge is a dish best eaten cold, um, figured out how to send Joe Hurst to jail, which he did. <laughs> um, but I think um, his early experience uh, in democracy building really had more to do with race. Mm -hmm. That, that um, campaign, um, there were almost no blacks who voted in his state senate race because almost no blacks in Sumter County were registered. Um, at that time in, in Georgia, um, uh, fewer than, um, even in majority black counties, uh, there would be fewer than 10% um, of uh, black uh, Americans were registered to vote. And there, were, there was a county in Alabama where there were zero black voters in a county that was 85% black. And so I think a good argument can be made that before the Civil Rights, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the United States didn't really live in a democracy uh, because so many of its citizens were not entitled to vote. And Carter was very uh, aware of this, even though um, he had to, by his own, admissions, own admission, duck the civil rights movement because he had to make a choice. Am I going to be in politics from this very conservative rural area, or am I going to be active in the civil rights movement? And as he explained to me when I was pressing him about this in one of my many interviews with him, um, you know, he decided he wanted to be governor. Instead, he made that choice, but he was very conscious of these issues all along. And in fact, his maiden speech in the Georgia State Senate in early 1963 was about something called the 30 questions. So uh, the 30 questions was like a, a, a variation on the literacy tests that I think you're familiar with. Um, and in, in Georgia, in uh, the counties in his area, the 30 questions for anybody black who dared to register to vote would be uh, things like, uh, who is the um, chief uh, solicitor uh, for the state of Georgia? Uh, what happens not only when the governor dies, but when his replacement dies, who then assumes the duties of governor of Georgia? Questions that no political scientist could answer. Right, designed to be unanswerable questions. And they would use these to prevent uh, uh, 
black people from voting and from registering. Um, and Carter gave a speech about this in the uh, Georgia State Senate and you know, talked about it when he ran for president. But the circumstances of that speech tell you a little bit about what life was like at that point when there was um, the first black member of the Georgia State Senate had just been elected the same year as Carter. And he was one of only four black uh, officials in the entire state of Georgia in 1963. So Carter gives this speech, but there's no record of it. I went looking for it, and the reason there was no record of it is that Carter chose to have their version of the congressional record not actually record his speech because he didn't want it reported on in his district. So it was kind of like a guy going to confessional. You know, he just wants the priest to hear that he's made this speech. And so he can say to himself, I made the speech about how unfair the 30 questions were, but I also took steps to make sure that my constituents wouldn't know that I gave this speech. And that gives you some sense of the balance that he had to strike. But then when he did become governor of Georgia and as president, he stood up really strong. Uh, he First, he integrated Georgia government, and then he took the United States government from tokenism to real diversity and um, appointed five times as many blacks and women to the federal bench as all of his predecessors combined and took the civil rights movement global with the human rights policy, which was a transformative policy in terms of democracy in the world and uh, had a lot to do with um, changing Latin America from mostly authoritarian to mostly democratic. When Carter was president, all of Latin America was authoritarian except for Venezuela, which was a democracy. And today, all of Latin America is democratic except for Venezuela. So um, these are major contributions that he made to democracy, which we can talk about later on, that you know took place during his presidency, not just in the aftermath. Thank you, Jonathan. And this leads us to Mary Robinson. And Mary, I want to ask you about your participation with former President Carter. Obviously, you're joining us <coughs> virtually um, in the elders and how you came to understand former President Carter's commitment to democracy and human rights and how that flowed through the elders and how it also intersected with uh, Nelson Mandela. Thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in Houston. I'm actually here with a group of women leaders in Bellagio in Italy. Uh, but Tough duty. Uh, I'm, delighted, I'm delighted to have the opportunity. We're, we're all very to, sorry about that, Madam. Yeah. Uh, very... no, I'm, I'm really, really glad to take part because I knew Jimmy Carter when he was still a candidate for the presidency as former governor of Georgia. I didn't rate his chances as being very great at the time, but um, I knew him as president. Um, I knew him when I was high commissioner for human rights in the Carter Center, the human rights uh, conferences that he had, which were extremely valuable. And then... I was delighted when Nelson Mandela in 2007 was persuaded to bring a group of elders, you know, former uh, men and women who had served in public office or in good moral positions, uh, not necessarily in formal government, because uh, you know, a, a number of our members, like Hina Jilani of Pakistan, is, is a, you know, a lawyer in the Supreme Court in Pakistan, a great human rights person. So it's a mixed bunch, but most have served in high office as, as former presidents or secretaries general like Kofi Annan and now Ban Ki-moon. Well, when we came together in 2007, what really struck me was how important to Jimmy Carter being an elder was. Uh, he came to the planning meeting in May in 2007, but I remember in particular the official launch of the elders in South Africa, in Johannesburg, in, uh, on, uh, in um, July, uh, 2007 on uh, Nelson Mandela, Madiba's 89th birthday. It was a very emotional occasion and it was clear that Jimmy Carter was taking very seriously uh, his sense of the responsibility of elders. Uh, you know, it, 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 Archbishop Tutu was our first chair and one of the things that I remember very well is that Archbishop Tutu wasn't always a good timekeeper, it didn't least necessarily start on time, but Jimmy Carter was there at every meeting, um, you know, starting at nine o'clock in the morning, he'd be there at nine o'clock, 
um, you know, and, and he waits for the rest of us. Um, not to, um, if, you know, not, uh, pretty patiently. In fact, what I learned about him was his simplicity and his humility with us as elders. Very quickly, we learned to call him Jimmy Carter, Jimmy. And, uh, you know, if, if I sound disrespectful, sometimes I fall back on the Jimmy because that's how I have known him now for um, since 2007. And uh, he fitted in very well. He had minimum secret service with him. They were very background, never intruded on our discussions. And he really, uh, from the beginning, wanted us to take seriously democracy, human rights, um, women's rights. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, I, I think... In many ways, uh, he, he possibly was the most serious about all our issues because there's a lot of humor in the elders, a lot of, you know, um, uh, you know taking time to have fun. And um, it, it's not that Jimmy didn't have a sense of humor, he does, but he was actually, uh, I think, the most serious um, in his passion um, as an elder. And then I witnessed um, from 2007 to about 2015, and then he, he became a an elder emeritus, as we call it, he retired. Um, during that period, he did cover a number of elections. And actually, I remember that he took part with Lacta Brahimi and Rasa Michelle, I think it was, in the first um, mission of the elders, which was to Sudan, ironically. Poor Sudan, that's in such problem now. I've just come from Nairobi, where we had a conference that covered very, uh, very acutely the situation in Sudan, which is, which is terrible at the moment. Um, that was his first uh, mission with us. And Mary, philosophically, did former President Carter believe that democracy was the path to human rights or human rights was the path to democracy? It's a good question. I think he integrated both perfectly. Um, he saw that human rights empowers individuals, but individuals need good governance, which is the democracy part, and they need to participate fully. And he often told us that story that um, Jonathan has just uh, talked about. I've read Jonathan's book, which I enjoyed because I told him he captured Jimmy Carter very well. Uh, if you like, warts and all, which is important. Thanks. You know, he wasn't, nobody's perfect. And, uh, um, but uh, but uh, I think uh, human rights were very fundamental to Jimmy Carter. I mean, among other things, I learned when I was High Commissioner that he had signed the a covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights, the international mm -hmm. covenant, which has never been adopted by the United States, which hasn't al also hasn't adopted the Convention on the Rights of the Child or the Convention on, uh, uh, on Women, the, um, the removal of discrimination against women. Um, so, but, but Carter was very aware mm -hmm. of the importance, not just of the United States, but of a global sense of democracy and human rights. It was, it was actually you know, what absolutely motivated him. So, David, I want you to pick up on that thought. The democracy program within the Carter Center, uh, with us since the 80s, I believe. Mm -hmm. Explain to the audience how it started, what it's accomplished, and what it seeks to work on in the future. Sure, and I'd like to just start by saying I think Jonathan and President Robinson have really kind of pulled together a lot of the, the main through lines that you see in President Carter about his commitment to human rights, about his commitment to individual values and respect for integrity of people, and his punctuality, which anybody who's worked for <laughs> President Carter will know it's, it's always there. Um, the Carter Center was started about 1985-86, a few years after President Carter, as he likes to say, was involuntarily retired. Yes. Uh, and our first election observation was in 1989. And since that time, we've observed more than 110 elections in about 40 countries uh, all over the world. And as uh, Avery mentioned in her opening remarks, President Carter's been on 39 of those or something like that. So he's always been personally involved. Uh, we've tried to focus on countries that we assess that there's, there's an, a difficult electoral and po political context. And there's deep divisions, there's a lack of trust, there's a sense that you know, people aren't really sure that they're gonna trust that what's gonna come out of this election process is, is gonna have popular confidence. We've also tried to work in places where our sense is that the election could be a moment of significant change. So where there's a great risk of uh, backsliding or where it could be a moment of a democratic break breakthrough. And so we've tried to focus on those places and we act as a, an outside independent third party verification entity essentially as, as an election observer. And President Carter has really pioneered 
that kind of role. He's brought it to prominence internationally and brought with his own experiences that Jonathan has talked about uh, in Georgia as, as a young politician and his own personal commitment and values. He and the Carter Center uh, view it as a means of conflict resolution. It's, it's the way where there's political differences that can be solved, uh, addressed, and solved through the ballot box. You know, channel that, those differences of opinion to places where people can actually participate and, and work that through in a, in a political way. A couple of major things that are you know, the hallmarks of our approach. Uh, we have to be officially invited and welcomed by the major political parties. We need to know that we will have the ability to move around a country, to have access to important information, to do credible work as observers, um, that we'll be able to speak publicly about what we find. Uh, we have a commitment to be transparent in our, in our methodology and to uh, report publicly what we see and to do that thoroughly. Uh, and some of the things that really draw on President Carter's own personal approach and, and beliefs and values and again, it goes back to some of the things that have been talked about here. A commitment to engage with respect and constructive conversation. So what you, know, what you observe with President Carter when you go on an election mission with him is he'll want to sit down and talk to political leaders from across the perspective. He'll want to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that they're there with good intentions, that they have constituents who have legitimate interests and concerns, and he, wanted, he wants us as observers to listen to them and to hear them out. And if they're concerned about a particular issue, you try to assess that, you try to do that thoroughly, and try to make sure that you know, we can come to uh, an overall assessment based on really looking thoroughly at the process. One of the things that um, uh, was evident from the very beginning is President Carter in these kinds of missions would ask all the major candidates, uh, are you willing to accept the results of an election? He asked them before when he would meet them in the, in the days and weeks leading up to an election. Can you commit that you will accept the results of an election if we as the outside force can credibly say that it was a fair process? And he would always do that and most of the time, There'd be some hemming and hawing, and you know, one of the things President Carter always says is politicians always think they're gonna win. They, they have blinders, and they're convinced that they're going to win, and I can talk to them about somebody who's been in that position and who's also lost. There's been a few occasions when people would not commit to that, but by and large in our experience internationally, they, they've been able to commit to that. And so throughout all this work, as President Carter's drawn on his personal moral authority to give the Carter Center that credibility that we can be a nonpartisan, credible actor. And over time, through the work that we've done, we've tried to ensure that that adheres to the institution as a whole, and we've tried to really build a consensus internationally among groups who do this on how do you assess an election in a fair and transparent way. And it's really trying to draw on President Carter's history and work. And as we did in the first panel, at some point, uh, write down your questions if you have them or write them down now. John or someone else will gather them and read them, but I want to make sure you have, know that that's part of the process as well. But David, it's impossible not to listen to you and ask the que that question that hangs heavily in the air. Does the American system need obser observation? Does it need external observation of the kind you have brought to so many other countries where there was no history of democracy. We have a history of democracy here, but some of the things you just raised are now fundamentally up for grabs in America right now. And what would it look like if you could even do that? So we are starting to do that. Um, you know, so I've been at the Carter Center for 32 years, and until 2020, we had taken a pretty consistent, strong line that everybody at the Carter Center understood. We focused our work internationally. But by the time of 2020, we looked around at the conditions in this country and it was exactly the kinds of things that would draw our involvement. The state of democracy was just of overwhelming concern. The lack of trust, the polarization, people not really living in the same information environments. And fundamentally, at the end of the day, a lack of clear sense that people trust the process. And that, that's when you need to have groups that kind of do the work that, fortunately, it's not just the Carter Center. One of the, as we've gotten to work in the United States, one of the things that's been most um, um, optimistic for me, the things that gives me hope, is engaging with the wide number of people, organizations, groups, 
they're actually, they understand the same kind of problem and they're committed to doing it. And I, I can say more, but mm -hmm. we, we are engaging in the U.S. now for the first time in our history since 2020. Uh, Madam President, Mary, if I could. Um, yes. David just mentioned former President Carter's moral authority. In your experience, did he carry that because he was Jimmy Carter or did he carry that because he was Jimmy Carter and a former president of the United States? I think a bit of both, actually. You know, being a former president and having that moral voice doubles the significance uh, because people knew that he'd been the president of the United States. So that, you know, allowed him to have more, uh, you know, impact because he was imbued with that deep sense of moral authority, of the importance of human rights, of the individual, of you know, breaking down barriers, etc. And I can really uh, support the role of the Carter Center in elections because uh, there was an election that Jimmy Carter was going to cover in Myanmar. Um, the election, I think it was in 2015, and he became ill. So he asked me if I would kindly lead that election with his grandson, uh, Jason Carter. Um, and I did. I, I, I traveled to Myanmar, joined up with the Carter um, uh, huge um, group of bright young people who were there all ready to, to go. Um, they showed me the technology of how they were going to assess the fairness of the election. Um, I'm not good on technology. I seem to be the slowest person to learn how to work this gadget that I had to work um, in the center. And I remember going along very early in the morning um, to the first um, um, elections center where the elections were taking place. Um, we were there at 6 a.m. because it was going to open shortly after that. There was a queue round the block and we asked the people at the start of the queue, they'd been there from 4 a.m. That was, it was like, to me, it was like South Africa in 1994. <laughs> uh, it was very, very moving. And all they wanted was to vote for what they called the lady. You know, we, we didn't, they didn't have yes. much English, but, but the lady was what they talked about. And, you know, it was very moving to cover that. And I remember, you know, I, mean, I, I think, you know, um, I think, why President Carter was so pleased to be an elder was precisely because he understood the moral voice um, that the elders can have. But it's hard, because unless you live your values completely, you don't have that. So unfortunately, we haven't found an American yet to replace Jimmy Carter. Um, I mean, he became emeritus, and we would you know, like to replace him. We're very fussy. Um, you know, understandably about who, who we will choose. So if anybody has bright ideas about candidates, let me know. <laughs> David, I want to ask you this, uh, building off what Mary just said. Can you convey to this audience if there is an example that's at the top of your mind of a situation that was tenuous in a country where the Carter Center's presence made things a little bit more resilient and produced a result that's proved to be durable? Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a whole lot, but I think one that, that always stands out and President Carter speaks uh, quite a, a bit about is uh, around the Palestinian elections mm -hmm. in 1996. Uh, Palestinians in East Jerusalem, uh, it's occupied by Israel, it's disputed territory, uh, but uh, Palestinians live there and want to vote in their own elections in the 1996 and, and subsequent elections, and there was disputes about uh, the procedures and the arrangements around how they would be able to vote, and it threatened to become something that could you know, blow up in terms of the, the overall acceptance of the process, because that's critical to both sides, Jerusalem and the ability to have that process go smoothly. And in the end of the day, it was about uh, allowing Palestinians to vote um, in post offices. The Israelis wanted it to appear that you know, they were casting mail ballots because they you know, aren't citizens of this city necessarily, and the Palestinians wanted to vote like it was a normal ballot box. And they agreed, when President Carter was central to reaching this agreement, that they would uh, vote at, po at, po at post offices, but they would use a box that had a slit right on the corner, so it wasn't in the top like a ballot box, nor um, putting a, a piece of mail in a, in a post office. Right. And that has been, uh, that same arrangement's been used in subsequent elections. Literally the middle ground, the right. middle ground. <laughs> Jonathan, um, in your conversations with former President Carter, was he, or did he suggest to you any dismay about the direction of American democracy? And did he reflect on the, le the net total of his involvement globally in advancing the interests of democracy? Um, 
Before I answer that question, I wanted to just um, point to another uh, critical election that he supervised early on. Uh, it was mm -hmm. one of the first ones. Uh, I think I know where was, you're going. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, am I getting too no, go far ahead. ahead no, of go the ahead. conversation? No, no, go ahead. But I just thought it would yeah. pick up um, off of David's point. So he started observing elections in 1989, and the first one in Panama did not go well. And uh, um, General Noriega, who had a, uh, a kind of a uh, stooge candidate running, um, told him beforehand, uh, you know, it's ridiculous the idea that we could possibly lose. And then when they did lose, when the Noriega candidate did lose, um, they did not relinquish power. And actually the U.S. invasion in um, the Bush administration uh, a few months later was an outgrowth of this failed election in 1989. But then uh, the following year in 1990, there was an election <clears throat> in Nicaragua between the incumbent, Daniel Ortega, who's back, I think people know he's back in power now, yes. and uh, he had been the leader of the Sandinistas, and a newspaper publisher who I uh, had interviewed a few years before this uh, named Violeta Chamorro. And um, uh, Chamorro won the election, and uh, Ortega was not willing to accept the outcome of the election. And um, it, when he finally did so, he was the first Marxist-Leninist, I think, anywhere in the world since the Russian Revolution, who left office voluntarily. What happened was Carter stayed up all night with him on the night of the election and said, uh, look, it's hard to lose. I lost, I know. And, but you know, for the good of your people, uh, you need to do this. And he said, well, um, okay, I could agree to this, but my commandantes also have to agree. So then Carter had to go into this larger group and convince all of them, look, relinquish power and you will, maybe in another election you can come back, which they did, um, but you need to do this for the good of your people. And he was able to convince them to do so, and then uh, before the settlement was announced, and there were other, you know, conditions um, on on this uh, their agreement, uh, he called Jim Baker, the Secretary of State, and in the middle of the night, and I think it was four o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and um, Baker uh, says, uh, "Well, what you know, what should the United States do?" And Carter says, "Do you have a pencil?" And he dictated the statement to Baker um, that the United States made after this, this agreement. Um, and uh, the Bush administration was enormously grateful mm -hmm. to Jimmy Carter for taking this huge problem of Nicaragua off of their plate of things to worry about. And in this period, it was the, you know, the warmest uh, of relations between Carter and Baker until 2005 because what happened the following year was that um, Carter, on the eve of the Gulf War, wrote all of the members of the Security Council and told them to defy the United States and vote against authorization for war, which the Bush administration was not amused by, shall we say. And, and later, um, when I interviewed George H.W. Bush not long before his death, you know, he had very, very nice things to say about Jimmy Carter, except on this one point where he said quite rightly that we only have one president of the United States at a time, and he shouldn't have been a, a, freelance, a freelancer out there doing that. Um, some people in his government wanted him investigated on the Logan Act. That's how hard the feelings were. But it gives you some sense of the good and not so good of Jimmy Carter uh, in um, you know, in this, this arena, but um, I, I just think that in light of what we experienced in 2020 with Trump's unwillingness to uh, yield where Daniel Ortega had, and the importance of the peaceful, of trans peaceful transfer of power for any democracy, the foundational importance of the peaceful transfer of power, um, Jimmy Carter really made a, a global contribution to that. In terms of reflecting about Trump, 
Um, uh, unfortunately, he had a serious fall in late 2019. And so even though I've seen him since, um, I haven't had any conversations with him, nor has really yeah. anybody else yeah. since then. So I don't really know firsthand what his reaction was to, um, to the uh, uh, events of January 6th. But I do know that in the summer of uh, 2019 at the Carter Center weekend, um, he said publicly that he thought that um, Trump had not been legitimately elected in 2016 that because of Russian interference. And he had long since begun saying that the United States had become an ol oligarchy and was no longer a fully functioning democracy. Mary, I want to pick up on what uh, Jonathan talked about in reference to Nicaragua in 1989. And if you think in retrospect that was a springboard for the Carter Center's ability to mediate or involve itself in a productive way in emerging elections or conversations in other countries, and also on the thing that, you, that Jonathan just talked about with this dispute with the George Herbert Walker Bush administration over the first Gulf War, that he would sometimes take very public views against the existing U.S. administration. Did that give him, oddly enough, maybe less credibility at home, but more credibility elsewhere? Well, on the first point, I think it's very hard to, con to do something successful in the peace context. We all know that. Uh, you know, you try and move very small things along. So Nicaragua was a big breakthrough, and I know that uh, Baker and the Bush administration were very appreciative, and that gave Carter you know, a kind of credibility as well, which helps the Carter Center in its work. Um, uh, I was delighted, personally, and I think a lot of the human rights people around the world were delighted that President Carter took such a stand um, against the war in Iraq. We're paying the cost of that war now, even in the context of the war in Ukraine. Part of the reason African countries, not all of them, some of them support, some of them um, abstain, those who abstain often say double standards. Look at what the United States did with the shock and all going into Iraq. That was not justified. There were no weapons of mass destruction. So, you know, there's a very heavy price still being paid for that decision, which has never really been brought to account by the United States, if I could put it that way. Um, you know, so I, I think it would be good if there was to be some real um, accounting of the cost to the world and to the reputation of the United States of that war. Uh, um, in Iraq. I, I understand that, uh, you know, uh, a point can be made that there's only one president at a time internally. I, I fully understand that. But uh, I, I salute Jimmy Carter for speaking up on such an important issue. I, I traveled with him a number of times as an elder to the Middle East, to Israel, Palestine, to Jordan beforehand. We went to, uh, he didn't come with us to Gaza, but otherwise um, he, he came with us. And I loved the way he could convey to both the Israelis and the Palestinians that he understood them. I learned a lot from him. You know, he had a wonderfully nuanced, deep, deep understanding of that situation. And it's very hard to navigate, as I think we all know. And I, I just learned so much and continue to learn so much from him. David, I want to ask you this, based on your experience with the former president and this work, were there times that the arrival of the Carter Center and former President Carter himself, where he was viewed more as an internationalist and less as a former American president, and that assisted? Or were there times where that was a complication? How was he viewed? Um, I think he was always viewed as, as both. I mean, I, th I think you know, people understood that he was an American president. There was no doubt about that. But I think you know, one of the benefits that, that we've had at the Carter Center is there is some separation. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's clear that we're not the U.S. government. We don't speak for the U.S. government. We never act like we do speak for the U.S. government. And quite often we say things that disagree with U.S. government policy, and President Carter himself might say things critical of the, of the current president. Uh, and I, th I think that, in some ways, that has helped our work internationally because it's clear that we're we're not beholden to the U.S. government, and quite often we are saying things that are in in alignment and you know helping U.S. foreign policy interests. But 
that's not what's driving President Carter, that's not what drives the Carter Center. It's really the commitment to the higher values of democracy, human rights, and peace, and justice. And, and that's, in some ways, it simplifies things. Mm -hmm. Can I can actually sure, come in please. on that? Yeah. Um, I, I noted that whenever the elders did something... Ooh. Oh. The, the dreaded buffering. We'll give it another second or two, and Jonathan, while we wait for the uh, buffering to work its way through, uh, did the president view this work as additive to American interests or sometimes separate from American interests? And why didn't other former presidents get so visibly involved with him? Were there any conversations about other presidents involving themselves this way? Or was he actually saying, no, I got it, uh, don't need your help? Well, he um, always claimed that he would report to the State Department mm -hmm. on his activities and did not take uh, unauthorized trips um, um, or, uh, but he always spoke his mind, whether in op-ed pieces, and there were many, um, that were critical of U.S. policy over the years, um, or sometimes in private. And in this case of the Gulf War that I mentioned, uh, it was the private nature of his contacts with foreign leaders that was so disturbing to George H.W. Bush and Jim Baker. Um, but he um, was a handful for incumbents. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, um, you know, they didn't really most of them didn't really appreciate him being a kind of freelance Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think if you look at what the national interest was and the, in the, in the interest of peace, you have to move beyond whether he, he ticked off, often it was Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, because of his activities. So just to briefly take just the one year of 1994, um, Carter uh, went with Colin Powell um, and Sam Nunn to Haiti, and mostly Carter, by the accounts of Nunn and, and Powell, uh, basically prevented a war. There was a, a, a U.S. force offshore, and uh, through a variety of really skillful diplomatic moves, uh, Carter um, convinced Cedrus, who was the strongman of Haiti, um, to back off, um, but he also made some concessions to Cedrus that were controversial in the human rights community. In any event, he prevented a war there. But then, after having done so, he went on CNN before reporting to President Clinton, which President Clinton wasn't happy about. And it happened another time that year in Korea, when mm -hmm. Carter goes to North Korea, uh, he meets with the founder of North Korea, uh, Kim Il-sung, and uh, prevents a war there, but um, basically goes on CNN and says, we will lift sanctions when that wasn't U.S. policy. <laughs> and when he finally got to the White House, he and Bill Clinton had a loud argument about this, and Carter doesn't really raise his voice, so I think it was mostly from Clinton's end, but it was eyewitnesses said it was the most combative conversation probably in American history between an incumbent and a former president. But I think the net effect was no bloodshed mm -hmm. in either Korea or Haiti. And so you have to credit that to Jimmy Carter's account. Uh, Madam uh, President, I believe you're back with us. Yes, I'm sorry. I don't know what, when, when I lost you, but we I found we, I was very lonely at a certain stage. <laughs> <laughs> we're, delighted, we're delighted to have you back. Uh, please uh, pick up your thought. And in addition, I want to ask you uh, about the through line for democracy, human rights, and specifically women's rights. Yeah. I, I had been just saying that I learned so much from Jimmy Carter uh, when, I, when the elders visited Israel and Palestine, which we did a number of times. And I just found that he... He understood both the Israelis and the Palestinians very profoundly and very deeply. And listening to him and being with him, uh, I learned so much about just how to handle that really difficult situation. But yes, I mean, my greatest uh, admiration of Jimmy Carter is 
how passionate he is about women's rights. I think he was the strongest voice among the elders on women's rights. We were all serious about it, and particularly women elders like Grassa Michelle and Ellen Joseph Sirleaf, and um, you know, uh, um, we, we uh, um, um, uh, grew Brunfeld. I mean, passionate about women's rights, but he, um, when we adopted a, a campaign about early child marriage, and we actually helped to develop a very big uh, network of those who were working on early child marriage, who had up to then been very sort of um, low key because it was a sensitive issue. And we helped them, encouraged them, and then brought them together in a huge uh, network called Girls Not Brides. And Jimmy would say, yes, that's fine, but we need to do more. We need to talk, tackle violence against women. We need to tackle this. I mean, he was just sort of, is such a wonderful voice on um, women's rights. And I, uh, I love him for that because it was so much part of him. David, uh, any observations that you had and memories of what Jonathan Alter just talked to us about uh, Haiti and uh, North Korea? Did that uh, complicate things at all? Did it uh, unsettle things within the center or at a future advocacy or future places? Not really. I mean, it, it, it was you know, and is how President Carter has <laughs> operated. I mean, I think you know, the other thing that we always you know, take great comfort in is President Carter is so clearly, honestly committed to what America should be, what he believes it can be, what he wants it to be, and the goodness of our values and our, our system. And so he's trying to hold a mirror to our society and always prioritizing peace and human rights. And you know he's not going to let that thing about there's only one president at a time stop him from speaking out. You know, it's you know. I mean, you know, generally he's tried not to do that. But mm -hmm. there's some things where it just it became too important. And 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 it's true. I mean, he always always would submit a report to the president. You know, whoever is currently in the White House on his trips would send it to them right away. That was his first priority. Mm -hmm. But sometimes he'd be on CNN first. Yeah, but he first written report goes to the... <laughs> but I think if you ju just one thing, if you look at sort yeah. of the post-war history in a larger sense, mm -hmm. uh, I think people tend to associate um, his human uh, rights policy with um, authoritarian regimes, but it also had a lot to do with the soft power that ended the Cold War and... and brought communist nations eventually to democracy. And uh, Larry Eagleburger, who became mm -hmm. Secretary of State, when he was ambassador uh, uh, under Bush, uh, when he was ambassador to Yugoslavia in the Carter administration, he was a career foreign service officer, he really resented when Pat Darien, who was the first and very uh, effective Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights, when she would come to Yugoslavia because you know, it made his life more difficult, and he didn't think it was the right thing to do. But later, he said, you know, I was wrong about that. Th this really did, this human rights policy, which, by the way, the Reagan administration continued. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, the press kind of misreported that. They made it seem like Elliot Abrams and the other people in the Reagan administration had reversed these Carter policies. They didn't. I interviewed Elliot about this. They continued these human rights policies. And it, as Vaskov Havel and others have said, it had a lot to do with hollowing out the moral authority of the Soviet Union and of communism in general. And um, you can't draw a cause and effect between that and the, you know, the, uh, the Berlin Wall coming down nine years later. But just to give you one quick example, um, Early on in the Carter administration, there was a prisoner swap with the Soviet Union. And um, when we got out a, uh, a, a, a religious figure had been um, imprisoned in the Soviet Union, and when Carter got him out, he brought him to Plains, and they were sitting in this tiny church in Plains where Carter taught Sunday school until very recently. And... Um, this gentleman um, takes the heel off of his shoe and he shows Rosalind Carter what's in the heel of the shoe. And it was a picture of her husband that had given him sustenance in the years that he was in prison. And the same Vaskov Havel tells similar, told similar stories about how 
just knowing that the President of the United States was on his side uh, helped keep his morale up when he was in prison. And um, Kim Dae-jong, who uh, um, eventually became uh, President of South Korea, or Prime Minister of South Korea, was in prison in mm -hmm. the Carter administration. And he later told Pat Darien that she and President Carter had, had saved his life, that he would have very likely been executed if they hadn't made a big deal about his case. So these kinds of things were going on while Carter was president, and what he has done as a former president, which often is you know overemphasized, and there's this kind of easy, phony, conventional wisdom, ah, mediocre president, you know, great former president. And even though Jimmy Carter doesn't belong on Mount Rushmore, you know, and had a lot of problems when he was president, I think we've lost sight of some of these very important and and visionary things that he did. There was a uh, famous political scientist uh, named Carl Deutsch who um, was um, doing a teaching at, at Emory and, and shortly after Carter was president and was in a bit of a, a funk, almost a, a little depression before he started the Carter Center. And he runs into Deutsch at Emory and Deutsch says, it was a very tough, was a very tough-minded guy. He said, you know, for all of your problems, all of your setbacks, you, your human rights policy will be remembered a thousand years from now because it was the first time that any head of state of a major nation made the way other nations treated their people and other nations' uh, lack of respect for democratic values central to their foreign policy. And that's a pretty big contribution. I want to pick up on that, Jonathan, and ask yeah. Madam President um, about that. Do you think that it's worth describing former President Carter as the first advocate and exponent of soft power? That's a phrase we use commonly now, but we didn't then. Yes. And yeah. it strikes me listening to Jonathan that that's exactly what he was on to, and he took it seriously, didn't give it a name, but he gave it visibility and viability. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that before, but I think you're right. Uh, and, and I agree that he also, as president, because having seen him as a candidate for presidency, we were members of the Trilateral Commission together, and I met him in Tokyo when he was a, an outside candidate. And I followed his election. Actually, he brought the Trilateral Commission, many of the members of it, into his administration. So I knew quite well what was going on while he was president, if you like, and I was following closely. And he, he was doing those quiet... Things And I, I do know that the human rights people greatly valued his presidency, as did environmentalists. Oh, you know, yeah. he, he was a very good environmental president as well. Um, really and, um, and then, um, you know, as a post-president, um, uh, he, 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 he was such a good person with the young people. You know, we would meet young people as elders. We, we liked the intergenerational, and he was always best at it. I remember him, he and Rosalind came to visit me when I was president which was between 1990 and 1997. I think this would have been about 1995, so three years before the Good Friday Agreement mm -hmm. that we've been marking. And um, I had um, football teams from Northern Ireland, from the Catholic and the Loyalist side, with their minders down. And they were going to come and see me after uh, Jimmy Carter and Rosalind, sorry, President Carter and Rosalind. And I said to him, would you like to meet them? You could stay on and uh, they'd love to meet you. And he was so good with them. He knew how to talk to these youngsters from Northern Ireland. I mean, it was, it was lovely to see. And David, that was you soft were, power. <laughs> David, you were nodding when I mentioned the idea of soft power, and please jump in. No, I think um, I actually, just like uh, President Robinson, ha have, haven't really conceived of it so much that way, I, but, I, but I do think it's, 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 it is an example of that. But it really, I, think, I don't think he's... I don't think it was motivated originally for him as an exercise of soft power as much as it was to live his values and what he believes about the, you know, the, best, the best principles that humans can live by and to really try to urge everybody to do that. It turns out that that can be applying soft power. Mm -hmm. Is the actual process of monitoring elections with the Carter Center harder now than it was in the 80s? 
Is technology made it any easier, made it more difficult? Has it made communicating about the viability and believability of an election more difficult in a social media environment? Yeah. So I thought you were going to ask, is it harder, you know, with President Carter, less and less involved? And, you know, yes and no. I mean, I think uh, the institution has really taken on the aura of, you know, what it means to be you know, J Jimmy Carter and the Carter Center and the kind of work that we do. But on the, where you did go with the question, yes, it's a lot harder. I mean, mm -hmm. the information environment, the politics around elections has always made it hard to, to do the job of assessing the fairness of that process. But when there's you know, the depth and the complications of how difficult it is now to really get people to understand what's true and what's false and, and how to try to give real evidence of that, it's vastly complicated what we've tried to do, mm -hmm. what we're trying to do. Jonathan, thoughts on this uh, soft power notion I've introduced? Um, yeah, it, you know, it, it was... I mean, uh, when President huge. Biden says, don't judge us by the example of our power, the power of our example, he's talking in that sort of phraseology. And we do have to keep uh, high um, the flag for these values. And I think we do in some ways that are not very well understood or that don't get very much attention. So... I, I was at a uh, panel on Saturday, um, and a woman named Amanda Bennett, who's the head of Voice of America, was there, and she was talking about, you know, all of the work that they do uh, in scores of countries, and they now were, she was asked about AI, and um, you know, after saying, well, obviously there's a lot of potential worrisome things about it, but she said that it can now translate. Uh, so it doesn't have to all go through English. So you can translate into these dozens and dozens of languages instantaneously and, and increase the reach. Now, this isn't propaganda. People think that we do this as propaganda. We mm -hmm. actually just report the news straight. But in many cases, it's the only real news that people in these countries are getting, and it's provided by the United States. And, and so there is a way to continue to propagate these, these values, and, and the right values. But we are in a struggle, which Biden's quite right about. We're in a struggle between democracy and authoritarianism. The struggle is going on in the United States. You're either on team democracy or you're on team authoritarian. It's a kind of a binary choice. And I think anybody who puts their party ahead of that choice really needs to take a hard look in the mirror. It's a real character test. It's not, a, I mean, this is where I love what Liz Cheney talks about. It's really not about any particular issue. It's about do you believe in our fundamental values, peaceful transfer of power, rule of law, and we can disagree about taxes and everything else, foreign policy, all day. It comes back to that. And I think the, the ability of us to have those values and the central choice that is facing so many countries in the world right now, front and center and well-defined, is the definition of what soft power in the 21st century means. Uh, Madam President, I'd like your thoughts on what Jonathan just said um, as you view what America is going through and what the arc of the conversation globally is, authoritarianism versus democracy. Your thoughts? Yeah, yeah my thoughts are these are difficult times, and it's not easy that the United States is no longer the shining example of democracy that, you know, it was being put forward as and, uh, you know, uh, I, I studied in the Harvard Law School and the class of 1968, that's a while ago, it was an incredible year, it influenced my life and I thought the United States has a constitution, a supreme court, laws, etc. that anybody in the world would envy. And it just shows how vigilant every country has to be and you can never take for granted. And I know that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the United States will come through what is a difficult period, but I do actually think that uh, President Biden, who was recently in my hometown of Balna in Ireland, um, uh, uh, is right that he is fighting for the soul of the nation in that sense. Because unfortunately, it's not just President Trump or former President Trump. It's the Republican, a lot of the Republican Party, by no means all, but quite a lot of 
elected representatives who either by their silence or by their vocal support are complicit in undermining democracy. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a tough message. I mean, uh, I, I hope that uh, lessons will be learned and that it will be countered. And Madam President, cast your gaze into Europe as well. I mean, this yes, there's a there's an authoritarian conversation going on there as well. There, there is indeed. I mean, uh, countries like Hungary within the European Union. I mean, the Pope is there at the moment, and also, you know, we have the same problem of not dealing well with migrants and the issues that that brings to uh, to European countries. And then we see the kind of uh, the fact that Ukrainians uh, are migrants who are acceptable. We've made terrific exception for them and rightly so but we should also be looking to uh, now you know the, the the terrible situation in sudan most sudanese if they have to leave sudan want to be nearby but some of them have to leave and go further and you know we, we need to welcome them equally otherwise uh, is that is that a, it, it, itself a form of racism so europe you know is, is no shining example either um, they, as elders we feel that um, you know since we came together in 2007 somehow you know, the issues have become more serious, the geopolitical shifts. Um, and I think, sadly, the shift, um, uh, the, the, the kind of relationship between China and the United States, I think the elders would like to see that cooling and, you know, um, less hot messaging on both sides. Um, you know, uh, uh, we need to understand that we are in a different and more multipolar world and that that probably sell, serves the world better. David, your thoughts on the arc of conversation globally and what the Carter Center is confronting, to Jonathan's point, authoritarianism, democracy. Yeah, I, I know we're getting close to the end of time, so I'll just be really brief to say that the one thing that's uh, constant in the work that we do around the world is that, uh, the message that we give almost every country is that no democracy is perfect. They all require vigilance and constant work. And for a long time, you know, at the Carter Center, we said that without having to be so concerned about the quality of the democracy at home. And now we're, you know, if there's a bright side to this, we're, we're, we're confronting the same struggles. And we can speak to it maybe in some ways even more credibly because we're also trying to work through those same questions about lack of confidence and really trying to stress the importance of transparency, respect, and accept for a good democratic process, but it, but it requires vigilance. No question. Uh, John, would you, come on up. This is going on a little bit long. Can you hear me OK? No. No. Is that better? This has gone on a little bit longer than we expected. Oh. I do appreciate everybody's comments. I have a couple of questions. Uh, what? Is that my fault? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, it's great. It's wonderful. Um, but I have a couple of questions I'd like to ask, and one of it is, can one of you discuss the Carter doc Doctrine and the difficult balancing act between promoting human rights and democracy versus protecting U.S. interests? Um, well, this was something that I wrote a lot, a lot about in my, in my book. Uh, much of Carter's human rights policy was, frankly, was a little bit hypocritical or at best unevenly applied for the reasons that you describe, so, you know, he early on he called the Shah of Iran a, a beacon of stability in the Middle East, and um, you know he he made uh, some uh, tough decisions in you know maintaining support for various not very attractive strongmen in different parts of the world because he, as president he had to put national interests. First, uh, as far as the Carter Doctrine went, um, that was really about um, intervention in our oil supplies in the Persian Gulf and um, making sure that he drew a red line uh, um, after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan to make sure that um, the world understood that we would not allow uh, any Soviet activity in the Gulf, even though Afghanistan was landlocked, and there was a big question as to, you know, whether what was truly at, at stake. But I think there's always going to be a balancing test, not only with uh, national interests and strategic, geostrategic interests, but also with peacekeeping. Now, this is something that I hadn't thought about. 
uh, until I started working on this book, it, there was a period when the head of Human Rights Watch and uh, Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, they went down and they had a very uncomfortable meeting with Carter in, in Atlanta um, because they felt he was being too soft on human rights. He was coddling dictators and not confronting them with you know, their many human rights abuses, even though he was also getting people out of jail at the same time and you know, selectively uh, intervening in human rights cases. He said, um, sometimes the interests of peace and human rights are at odds, but his position was, first you have to get the bullets to stop flying, that you can't have human rights and democracy until you have peace. So he actually put, you know, he had human rights up there at the very top of what he considered to be his contributions as president and a, and a former president, but um, peace was always a little bit, a little bit ahead when the two came into conflict. Very good. One one last question, uh, and this was regarding Peter Baker's recent story about <laughs> Texas Governor John Conley. That was uh, something I believe H.W. Brands had mentioned in his book about Ronald yes. Reagan. Uh, what do you think the impact of this article is that suggested that John Conley and Ben Barnes went to Middle Eastern countries and tried to help arrange the late release of the prisoners after Carter left office? So I'm sorry to speak twice in a row, but either today as we speak or the latest tomorrow, uh, I, I co-authored an article in the New Republic with Stuart Eisenstadt, who was Carter's chief domestic policy advisor, Kai Bird, who after my book came out, came out with a uh, biography of Jimmy Carter, and Gary Sick, who had been the Iran specialist on the National Security Council, and he had written a, uh, uh, a book about the October surprise. And we decided we're gonna move beyond conspiracy theories to what we actually know as historical fact now about this matter. And, the Peter Barnes, uh, the, uh, the Peter Baker story, which was about how William Casey, who was Reagan's 1980 campaign manager and later became his CIA director, had sent former Governor Connolly and Ben Barnes, who's still alive, to the Middle East to urge Middle Eastern leaders to contact Tehran and tell them, don't release the hostages, you'll get a better deal from Reagan. Um, so we interviewed uh, Stu Spencer, who was um, Reagan's chief strategist, and he totally backed our conclusions. He had been talking to Casey every day. That was just confirmation of what we now know, and we have better evidence beyond John Connolly that William Casey uh, ran a multi-pronged covert operation to try to manipulate the outcome of the 1980 election by getting them to delay the release of the hostages. Which, what we don't know is that there was a completed deal. Mm -hmm. We have no document showing there was a deal. The testimony that there was a deal is not uh, reliable enough for us to draw that historical conclusion. But we know for sure that Casey should go down in the annals of infamy because he tried to do this and tried to prolong the captivity of these Americans in these dank basements, blindfolded, longer so that he could benefit his, can his candidate. And that is truly reprehensible. Reagan, by the way, there's no evidence at all that Reagan himself knew anything about any of this. Very good. Thank uh, you so much, Madam President. We appreciate you joining us today. To the panelists. I really have to go. I have to go back to my women leaders now. So okay. thank you so much, ma'am. <laughs> Adios. Thank you, fellas. <laughs>
Thank you very much for coming back in. Our last panel discussion is one that I think is one of the most interesting to me. Denying electorate results in the United States has been good for the business of losing candidates. Since he lost the 2020 presidential election, Donald Trump has hauled in more than 135 million in contributions, largely as he continues to repeat his baseless claims that the election of 2020 was stolen. Last year in Georgia, Stacey Abrams raised more than $100 million while losing her second gubernatorial one, run. That gubernatorial run focused on allegations that her supporters were systematically kept from voting in the, her 2016 loss. Georgia courts largely rejected those claims. And in Arizona, Kari Lake elevated her profile as an election denier by raising $2.5 million in less than two months after her loss. Lake promised contributors she would use the money to overturn the election results, but she only spent about 10% of the money raised on her, in, on her election challenge, and the result stood. Today, she's mentioned as a potential running mate for Trump should he win the, his party's nomination. Our next panel will discuss the alarming trend that is occurring as candidates for both political parties cry foul after losing elections. Election denial in many ways has become a wedge issue that brings money into candidates' campaign coffers and motivates some voters to the polls. Today's moderator is Darren Shaw. He's a distinguished teaching professor and Frank C. Irwin Chair of State Politics at the, the University of Texas at Austin. <laughs> he is also a leading pollster whose clients include Fox News, the Texas Tribune, and the Texas Lyceum. Our panelists are Ben Ginsberg, the Volcker Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Hoover Institute, and a nationally known political law advocate representing participants on, in the political process. Barry Jackson, a Republican political strategist who definitely negotiates at the intersection of politics and public policy. Before his current job, he served two, two, term, two uh, stints as Chief of Staff to former Speaker of the House John Boehner. And the Honorable Anise Parker, three-term Houston mayor from 2010 to 2016, she now serves as the president and CEO of the LBGTQ Plus Victory Fund and Victory Institute. And of course, Mayor Parker is the only Rice graduate ever, ever elected mayor of this city. Before, <laughs> and as Bob Lanier liked to remind her, she's, she's a member of Mensa too. Before I, I turn this panel over, I'd like to start with one question for the group, and this was one that somebody had submitted earlier, but it seemed uh, more pertinent for this one. In, under, in Mark Jones's uh, polls, he saw little difference among voters on many areas. Voters who voted in Georgia and Texas largely felt like it was easy and there was little efforts to keep them from voting. Would any of you think that any of our politicians today would have the same position? You want to start there? Yeah. Good. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> and, and East, why don't we just go down the line here? So I have uh, trusted my livelihood to the voters 11 times. Um, nine times they did the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> I lost two races, and then I figured it out, and, and then nine consecutive ones. And what we have to remember is that there are you know, we think of elections, it's the voters and the uh, voters and the candidates, and they're in a dialogue with, with each other, but they're also in the mix are uh, consultants and political operatives and uh, nonprofit organizations that raise a lot of money off the elections, and there are uh, uh, the, the media that is calling the horse race. And, uh, 
I had never once doubted the, the outcome of my elections or had any concerns about it. And I don't, and I think the majority of candidates would say the same thing. And I, as Mark Jones's poll show, the majority of voters think the same thing. But that's not what you're hearing. You're hearing from the consultants and the operatives and the media that's calling the horse race and, and wants the tension and wants to, to uh, drive up that binary. Um, and it's all about the, it's all about the, uh, again, the horse race, the binary. Are you expanding opportunity? Are you going to protect election integrity? Are you going to, are you disenfranchising people? Are you delegitimizing the election? Is it all about voter suppression or is it about we have to prevent voter fraud? Is it, will it be more and more convenient or by God, this is a responsibility and a, and a right and who cares if it's convenient? It's worth a little bit of time to do it. And it's always this, this binary, but I don't think it's coming from the voters or the candidates. Ben. Well, first of all, I should say that I retired for better or for worse from the Society of Hourly Billers before all those riches that uh, John described <laughs> started coming through the process. Um, look, I spent 38 years uh, representing Republican candidates and party committees, including looking, walking precincts, doing nationwide boiler operations, checking on voting and how it was going. So we were convinced, I would say, during that period that there was fraud going on, so we always looked for it. And the truth of the matter was, we didn't, we didn't find it in a way that could have affected the outcome of all but two elections in, in that 38-year period. So in, in that period, it was also pretty evident that voters, most voters could vote easily and without barriers. Um, that also means that the charges of suppression that you've heard strike me about as valid as the charges of fraud that you've heard. In 2013 and 2014, I was co-chairman of a presidential commission on election administration with Bob Bauer, who's a, a Democratic lawyer and was President Obama's counsel and Joe Biden's counsel. And we looked, our charge was to look at the whole voting experience and the predicate for it was the long lines in the 2012 election, which is a handicap to some voters to look at it. So we made a very thorough examination of the state of voting at the time. And there were long lines to be sure in some uh, polling locations. As you heard earlier this morning, that was generally a problem with election administrators not putting out the right resources and in fact, Polling places right nearby did not have lines, which would suggest that administrative uh, shortcomings in particular places led to lines. Not a problem for the vast majority of voters to vote, as, as Mark's statistics today show. So I think a lot of this is overblown. We can talk a little bit about the fraud suppression industrial complex that is sort of hyping up a lot of the, the bad polarizing feelings in the country today as we, uh, as we go through the program. Barry, your thoughts on uh, John's prefatory comments here, or question? Yeah, I, um, I agree with the mayor that I, I rarely encounter candidates who don't put their faith and trust in the voters. Um, it's why I never run for office. I'm scared to death to put <laughs> myself in front of the voters, but I have huge respect for everybody who does. Um, but it, to, to add what they've said, I think part of this is if you're a candidate, by and large, and I'm going to commit the crime I'm going to accuse people of, is that the language of elections and the language of the media and the optimization model is absolutism. And, and what we have a hard time with when you couple on top of that, that the way technology has advanced and just natural human behavior of seeing an example and extrapolating from that, that's where the coverage goes. So as Ben was saying, okay, here's a place with really long lines. Oh my God, that's horrific. Ergo, I'm going to extrapolate out. That's voter suppression and it's all over the place. Well, well no, there's perfectly legitimate 
reason for this, and and the and at least my last point on this is is that if there's a crime that's being committed by the entire political media industrial complex, um, it it's a disdain for the common sense of voters, and. I don't know what the answer to that is, but it is a key component to how we're going to get ourselves out of this constant war that we're in with ourselves, basically. Right. So uh, the title of our panel is a poison of, Poisonous Politics of Election Denial. Now I say that because the initial panel was called Effects of Election Law Changes on Voter Turnout in Georgia and Texas, and they proceeded to talk about the personal <coughs> politics of election denial for an hour and a half. So uh, there's going to be uh, some repeated information probably, but hopefully some different perspectives, and we're going to drill down explicitly on this topic. Um, just so you know where we're going, we'll do about 40, 45 minutes of kind of panel Q&A, and then we would really mu very much like to get you all involved in the conversation to pick the brains of our experts here. All right, so um, initially, let me just ask kind of broad set of questions of the panel at large. How good or how bad is the U.S. election process? And what I'd like you specifically to address is both historically within the context of American elections, but also to the extent we have any kind of comparative knowledge. How, how good or bad are we at this right now? Me again, okay. Yeah, you, you made the mistake of sitting next to me. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't give me a choice. I know, Sorry I about know. that. I never um, do. That's my strategy. <laughs> I think, by and large, we have a really excellent election system. And, and again, going back to uh, uh, Mark Jones's um, PowerPoint that he did earlier, the fact that uh, a lot of trust in elections, a lot of of uh, unanimity in, in terms of how folks across the political spectrum and in, in different communities have, uh, even with all of this disinformation that we are uh, being subjected to right now, still have faith in the election process overall. Yes, there are groups that are making a lot of money off of election denial and, 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 and pushing the, the divide, but uh, it, this is a relatively recent fissure in uh, uh, the uh, you know, Americans' view of elections. You may hate the other party, you may hate the other guy, but generally the feeling that this was, yeah. you, you, you trusted in the, in the process. Anissa, did you, did, you, did you get any of this when you were running in Houston? Was, no, this, a, was it, this a thing when you ran? It, it, no, but uh, almost all mayors across America run in a nonpartisan system and our, uh, uh, you know, I'm a Democrat, Houston hasn't elected a, a, a Republican as mayor in generation, right. but local government is so fundamentally different than the, uh, what happens in the state legislature, or what happens in, in Washington. The, you know, one of the reasons I stopped after I was termed out, termed out of the mayor's office is I didn't, I didn't want to get into that right. uh, political fray. Um, Barbara Bush endorsed me when I ran for mayor. Barbara Bush would never endorse me if I were to run for, uh, you know, state white office right. in Texas, where she's uh, still available to do that. Let me just say, and the and but the reason is that the the cal the political calculus is different. Local government is run by uh, pragmatic policy wonks. And if you look at uh, the, where democracy works best in America, it works at the local level. Where, where does government, government function best? At the local level. Because it is, it's operational and immediate. It's not theoretical, it's about, you know, can you fix that pothole or can you get the trash picked up? And when you focus at that level, uh, it is really about, about competence. And uh, when, you move that, when you begin to move beyond that, and you, you, don't have, you don't have anything real to do every day, like you're in the Texas legislature, you can, you play games. Yeah. Are you concerned, and uh, we'll obviously kind of go all over the place with this conversation with all of our panelists, but are you concerned about it filtering down? Yes. Um, I've, I've talked to people, I'm from Austin, and people in the Ean School District, for instance, uh, run for school board, have talked about 
and these are nonpartisan elections as well, but are concerned about the atmosphere and the atmospherics around ostensibly nonpartisan local races. So what I do t today, uh, I, I run something called the LGBTQ Victory Fund, Victory Institute. It's a DC-based organization. I hasten to say I still live here in Houston, do it remotely. Um, but we only work with uh, candidates from the LGBT community. We don't do lobbying, we don't do policy, it's just about can we help our endorsed candidates win election. We're a, we're a bundling pack. And we're the only national organization in, my, in our space that, that does down ballot races. So I have school board candidates all across the country. I have uh, city council candidates, state house candidates. We, every level of the ballot. And when I started with Victory five years ago, I will say that it really, it restored my faith in democracy. It, you know, was a little, I frankly, was a little shaken after the election of Trump. And what I see over and over again is folks who, who just want to represent their neighbors, who want to do the right thing in their community. School board races, school board service is entry level politics and it is the worst level of politics you can get into because it is it's people's kids and it's in it's the the minutia of, of of what happens inside uh, a school but it's people's kids and it's about uh you know what the books are but it's people's kids and you know it's just like it's emotional and it's all emotional and what we see uh right now is an effort to use these school board races as uh, a way, uh, you know, a, a, a new b battleground in the in the culture wars, and a way to. You know, it's not running for school board because you want to be on school board. It's running for school board because you have your eye on some other political position down the road, and it is it's more of a a pipeline. It's both a culture war exercise and a pipeline right. exercise, and it is ultimately going to be to the great disservice of our children. And it is also a, um, because it is that entry level of politics, and this is, this is neighbors against neighbors, it's gonna have long-term uh, negative impacts. And I'm really, when I say, you know, five years ago, I was really invigorated by what I see these last few years with what's happening, particularly in school districts, school boards, school board meetings, that's uh, horrifying and, and frightening. This is not about election denial, this is about, uh, attacking kids to make a political point, and there's nothing more inappropriate and unfortunate. Yeah, let me uh, let me move to uh, Barry and Ben, and uh, in, uh, I know Ben has a lot of experience with this, but I want Barry to chime in too. You know, I asked broadly about uh, you know quality of elections in the United States, how we assess it, but but maybe if you could tell us a little bit about what you know about election administration, about uh, is it getting is it improving? Is it declining? And because you both have expertise on this, and this was part of the conversation earlier, I think, which which noted correctly about how um, how dedicated and, and and hardworking these individuals are. But has that changed over time? Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? What what do you think about the administration of elections in the United States? Well, a bit of history. Um, Elections in the United States were not a subject anyone worried about their credibility up until uh, an incident you all may remember called Bush versus Gore in 2000, at which point all of a sudden the whole field of election administration and the accuracy of elections kind of got turbocharged. It was a 537 vote victory. There were hanging chads. Uh, it shed a light on the fact that the U.S. election administration system is not perfect. Congress passed a new law and put a whole ton of money into elections in 2003, the Help America Vote Act. That allowed jurisdictions all over the country to buy new and better equipment, and it professionalized the business of election administration. So that I think that the quality of not only the personnel drawn to it, but the, the equipment that's used for it, the methodology that's used for it, got much more professionalized and, um, and improved. And if you really need an example of that, look at the 2020 election. There was a pandemic, yet we had historically high voter turnout. 
So that is a tribute to the American electoral system. It came under unprecedented challenge in 2020, yet there's been no substantive proof behind any of the allegations that roiled the 2020 election. So that's important to, um, to remember as well. But I think you also have to be honest about what the American electoral system is. Uh, because we uh, practice a fierce federalism in this country, there are over 10,000 jurisdictions, individual jurisdictions responsible for the casting, counting, certification of votes. And as you all know from experience, there will be, and let me say this gently, some variations in quality among 10,000 jurisdictions. So while we, we hold to the principle of every person's vote is created equal, you've also got 10,000 jurisdictions with some problems. The equipment is not equally good. The registration systems are not equally good. So there is always, first of all, room for improvement. And secondly, always a little bit of a ground where people can stir up trouble if they want to. But yes, overall, I think the American electoral system uh, is accurate, is secure, has improved over time. But as I think Brad Ravensburger will tell you, it is a constant effort to make it even better. Barry, your thoughts? Yeah, so my um, first real job in politics, I was the youngest elected county chairman in the state of Iowa, which sounded kind of cool, but it would be sort of like being in the Republican county chair in Austin. It's not a job that everybody goes running to. I was in Iowa City. Um, but I'm a young college kid, and it's where I first learned about how elections are administered, because I had to go out and recruit men and women to show up and be poll watchers, and which ones were going to be there all day versus which ones were going to be volunteers. And I got the yep, yep, yep from over on this side from the, you know, what at the time we would call the country club set about these people over here because they're the crazies. You know, why can't I do something about the crazies? I was like, because they show up, they're passionate, they care, and I need bodies. My job was to make sure they were trained. And, you know, Ben's, a lot of Ben's career was this also is like here's what we're watching for you know here's the things and and the federalism point is really clear because I, every campaign i've ever been on the very first thing you look at is how do you get on the ballot how do you get thrown off of the ballot how you know every process is different and the rules are the rules once you know the rules fair game so i agree always room for improvement I think we've got a great election system. If I had to have a, a, an issue that I don't know what the answer to, but it bothers me is, the, is that the um, you know, voting is a human activity, which means it is prone to error. And error does not mean intentional fraud or deceit. It just has been said delicately. There's just <laughs> different levels of capacity and understanding of that. And I think the it appears that that there's too many ways where people believe there's an access point somehow to cheat. And even though you rarely see it, I'll go back to that thing I said about absolutism. So when when voters hear you say there's absolutely no fraud and then there's an elected official that gets thrown in jail for voter fraud. Well, wait a minute, there's like, you can't have it this way when this is going on. And so I think that degree of understanding of, of the human error and sometimes ill will, it does happen. And what's heightened it is that elections are so close in so many jurisdictions. So now, you know, when we were growing up, every vote counts. I'm like, really? I'm in an 80, 20 county, every vote counts? <laughs> Now it really kind of does. So I think that that's the one thing. I don't know what the improvement is, but if there's one thing that still bothers me about the system today, I don't know what, how to fix that part of it, but it's key to us getting out of this morass. Right. Uh, John, I want to see if I could uh, get a couple numbers up here real quick. Let's see if, 
Okay. So I'm going to start the kind of second round of questioning here with a, a bit of a conundrum. So this is uh, data taken from the U.S. Elections Project. This is Michael McDonald, who was at George Mason. I think he's at uh, Florida now, Mark, probably correct me on that. Uh, and I want to point out this uh, runs basically the post-war period in the United States. So you have uh, relatively high turnout in the 50s and 60s, and then you see this sort of secular decline all the way through the 1996 election, with the 92 parole race being the one outlier here. But since 1996, you've had 52 percent was turned out in the, uh, the Clinton Dole parole race, all the way up to about 67 percent in 2020. We are now exceeding the levels of turnout that we had in the 1950s and 60s. All right. If you look at midterm elections, you see basically the same thing. Midterm elections are, by definition, sort of less salient than presidential elections. But you see this sort of high water mark in the 1960s, followed by a trough, despite the fact that we have uh, improvements in education, Civil Rights Act, motor voter, you still have lower turnout. And then it ticks up a little bit in the 2000s with the down spike in 2014, but look at it in 2018 and 2020. So empirical fact, higher turnout in American elections. Here's confidence in U.S. elections by party from 2004 onward. So this is a percent saying they have uh, a fair amount or a great deal of confidence in American elections. So you see the Republicans, you see the partisans sort of split with Republicans going from about 90 percent confidence down to less than 50 percent confidence in the last two election cycles. Democrats weren't that happy with the Bush elections, but they spike up. A little suspicious after the Trump election, but ecstatic after the Biden victory. And independence, as you might expect, kind of stuck in the middle. But if you take independence as a decent representation of a midpoint here, confidence is you know, between 50, maybe two-thirds have some. This is some or a great deal. So um, this isn't a high bar here. Um, confidence in U.S. elections overall has sort of ebbed, and it's become very partisan. How can you have better election administration, right? Higher turnout, but lower confidence. And my question really is, what's at the heart of, give me an explanatory variable. Give me a hypothesis why we've got lower confidence. And I'll throw four culprits out there, just to name names. Traditional news media, social media, political consultants, or political elected officials. You can ignore them, take them all, whatever you want. Barry, why don't you? So I, it's, um, it's a mix of, of all of that. And not knowing how the the question was worded, which is always the fallback <laughs> on, on these kinds. Of, right. But the thing I would say is is that both parties are suffering from the same problem in the middle, which is the lack of intelligent conversation about policy. Now, uh, you know, some guys that I work with on election stuff disengaged voters, center-right voters, so mid to low propensity, soft Republican kind of thing. In 1916, or 2016, we identified 18 million of those. In this last election, 61 million. And what you find from talking to those voters is their discontent with elections it, is about nobody's talking to them as adults about issues they actually kind of care about. And to highlight it, to get into the grifter class of consultants, um, you know, we're now the communication level, which is nonstop and is kind of non traceable. I probably get close to 500 emails every week because I'm an idiot and I'm on all kinds of lists. The language that is used in these missives, I, I, I am absolutely certain the candidate or elected official has no clue what's going out over her, his or her name. And it's the most vitriolic, atrocious, divisive language because, and think about with chat GBT where we're headed, how do I optimize the response? They're not talking to the disengaged voter. They're talking to the highly partisan voter. And the way I stir them up is the election was stolen or, you know, blah, 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 blah. So 
I, I can look at all of this, but I'm going to come back to until both parties can figure out how to talk intelligently to voters about different issues and to accept that in a voter's, it is okay for a voter to hold two thoughts that as a political person, I think are in conflict with each other, but for a normal person, it's not. I can hold these two thoughts. I'm trying to find where the middle is and we don't treat voters with respect about that. Let me throw out two other factors. Um, number one is we live in a very polarized society today. You've read a lot about that. You know about that. Um, that also means that messaging, as Barry was saying, is very much directed to the most partisans. The second phenomenon is something that one of Darren's colleagues at, at the University of Texas has written about called the big sort which basically means over the last 50 years, there's been a demographic trend in the country for people to live with people more like themselves. So our neighborhoods and therefore who we come in contact with is much more a homogeneous experience without more interchange or understanding people who, um, who are not like that, uh, like themselves. So you fast forward that to politics and what we're talking about in election administration. And I think the other factor that you need to throw in is political candidates. I mean, to be honest, in looking at the credibility of elections, we've never before had a presidential candidate, let alone a sitting president of the United States, uh, take a full-fledged sledgehammer to the credibility of, of our elections. And that makes a difference in a polarized country with the communications channels that, um, that Barry was talking about. Now within that, the fraud suppression dichotomy we were talking about, Republicans see fraud everywhere, Democrats see suppression everywhere. There is not so much evidence of, of either. But, and this goes to, to the parties and to an extent their candidates, Fraud versus suppression has become the, the get out the vote model and mantra for parties. So that the parties and their consultants in order to motivate their base to turn out to vote with the shrinking middle are more and more hard edged about fraud and suppression, which has the result of attacking the credibility of the election system from both sides. So. I do not believe there is any one single factor that does this, but it's sort of an unholy mashup of um, factors at this point in time. And so when we get to the solutions part, Darren, it'll be a, it'll be a thrill. <laughs> well, let me, let me throw something on the fire wait, here. Wait a minute, I wanted yeah, to say something that what, that what Barry said. Uh, a candidate is responsible for everything that comes out of their campaign. Mm -hmm. And yes, I absolutely believe that most of those candidates have no clue what their people, shame on them. Yep. Um, but I would also say that it, this is about, you know, there's a huge swath of voters, even with, uh, what, looking at, oh, no, never mind, you don't have to take it back. Party ID, uh, you have, a, but uh, the confidence in elections and the voter and the voter turnout, there's still a huge swath of folks who, yeah, maybe I'll show up, maybe I won't show up. And it's like talking to your kids. What happens when they don't listen to you? You get louder, and you get louder, and you're trying to because you're trying to get their attention. And it's not a um, yes. We're in the echo chamber. There's a there's a lot of vested interests who are working to to ramp it up. And it's a this the the binary is it uh, you know uh, disenfranchisement or, or delegitimizing, but. This is all about how do you get the attention of an American electorate that, you know, when the country's doing pretty well, they're happy to stay home. They show up and they're worried. Yeah. Let me just, uh, I think I know the answer to this given what you three have just said, but I was talking with somebody in the last election and uh, a consultant and I asked a question that I'll pose to you now. Uh, and the context was a discussion about Georgia and messaging um, about voter suppression and the Democrats were hitting very hard on a voter suppression message. And the consultant said to me, 
which would you rather run on? You know, Joe Biden's economic record or the Republicans are trying to take away your right to vote? And I asked him, would you rather have the reforms, the policy reforms that you are seeking on elections, or would you rather have the issue? And very much anonymously, they said, I'd much rather have the issue. Um, do you think that's kind of globally felt by consultants that you work with, that they would prefer to have the issue of voter fraud or voter suppression rather than they would actually address these issues? They're to being the paid they to win elections. Yeah. 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 And, I, and, and frankly, I want to go back to that. What I talked about that group of I've talked from the right side, center right disengaged voters. It's not just the election stuff, it's everything. I mean, so I either had the great privilege or the you know, great burden. My entire time in D.C., I only had two bosses John Boehner, George W. Bush, which makes me an outcast in my own party today. But I remember in 2010, I come back to Boehner's office. Our consultants and our kind of over hyper candidates, we need to run on repealing Obamacare. Like, excuse me? Well, everybody hates it. Like, well, there's zero chance we're ever going to repeal Obamacare. We're going to, it'll never get through the Senate, and even if it did, the President of the United States is not going to sign a bill overturning his signature accomplishment. Why are we going out and telling our voters this? Oh, because they love this. What's going to happen when we don't do it? Well, we'll run on it again. Like, oh, at some point, they're going to get pissed off at us. Like, you guys are worthless. You're squishes. You can't accomplish anything. So I think it's beyond just the election stuff. It is. It goes back to this optimization, monetization, and so few, this is the other problem, our campaign consultants, so few of them have actually worked on a real campaign. Mm. Much less yeah. actually then went into office and like, wow, we said all this crap on the campaign trail, and now we're supposed to deliver. I don't know how to do this. The grifter well, class I thought was a great line. Well, it's not only, it's, uh, <laughs> the consultants, the consultants, to be sure, have their models for getting out the vote. And there is an industrial complex of consultants who make a ton of money on all these missives that you hear. But let's also recognize that the nonprofit community is in this just as much, that, that it is deeper than just the political class, mm -hmm. and that you have organizations on the right and the left who are fighting and filing charges of fraud and suppression against the other. That's what the business model of the C3s and the C4s is based on. There's a huge amount of election litigation that's been filed, especially over the last two cycles, uh, challenging laws that have been passed as either fraud or suppression. The majority of those cases do not work, but they also have the effect of telling voters don't trust your system, that the system lacks credibility. So it's broader than just um, the political class, I think. And if you're going to, you know, I, I can't imagine like saying, all right, we're not talking about fraud and suppression anymore in elections. How many consultants and nonprofits would just like go into the fetal position and not come mm -hmm. out for a while? Yep. <laughs> okay, I don't want to let social media off the hook although you might. Let me put it to you. Uh, does the Twitterverse, does the availability of these social media outlets as a prominent platform for sort of articulating this stuff, is, is it, obviously it provides a platform, but is it a particular form of platform? I mean, would this seep out anyway? Or do you think that uh, the particular kind of constitution of social media helps it? I'm thinking here of sort of the lack of accountability, the, you know, the sort of dominance of social media on more polarized voices. Um, is this just one of, another, uh, of a number of factors or is it not a factor? Am I overrating it? What do you think about this? Well, I, so I would, I would separate Twitter from everything else. Right? Twitter is this closed loop of weird people that talk to each other and yell at each other. I have no idea. Never been on it, so I 
I get to be judgmental. <laughs> but, the, but the other definition of the social media is uh, it, it's creepy. The amount of data every single person in this room has got accumulated on them by all these data sets. And you can communicate one on one. So I'm on TikTok or Facebook or just you know surfing the web and these individualized, highly targeted messages. So you, you could be sitting on the couch, you and your wife watching TV, and you're doom scrolling, and you're both going to get an ad on your, your device that even though you're sitting next to each other, completely different from each other. Mm -hmm. That's the part that worries me because there's no filter. I can see it. I don't want to say it's like pornography, but nobody has to know that I've seen this, and I just keep getting it and getting it and getting it. And it reinforces in my mind that there's suppression or there's fraud or that side's doing X and this side's doing Y. And it, and it you know, your point, Mayor, about the local side of this is that, you know, there shouldn't be a Republican or Democrat way or a conservative or liberal way to, you know, build a firehouse. No. But that's now where it is. And I think it's driven by that. You know, but I have to say, in, de in defense of social media, and I'm not great, I do tweet, uh, I, I don't, I'm, I, I, I have a Facebook page that my campaign set up and I don't use it, don't go to the Facebook page. Um, it is a tool to connect like-minded people around the globe. And as that tool to, collect to connect like-minded people, it is an amazing, instrument of democracy and so, a barrier against social isolation and uh, uh, in very repressive regimes you know that democratic uh, uh, you know, insurgents use these social media tools to find each other and to organize and it's and it's a great thing but it's also it's reading the comment section of the you know the newspaper or it's reading it's it's uh, the, it's the id on display too often. So it is, it is a wonderful thing and it's a terrible thing at the same time. And um, you know, I don't know that we can separate the good and the, and the bad, it just is. Yeah, just the, the notion of democratizing conversation, political communication, I mean, Ben and I can, and, and Barry I know, can particularly attest to the democratization of information about elections. Um, yeah. You know, the, the notion of Fred's is a small editorial comment, but um, somewhere, somebody in their basement has a spreadsheet looking at the precinct totals from the last election cycle and comparing them to the current precinct totals. I tell you for a fact that goes on. I'm not sure that's a bad thing, um, but in the wrong hands and with motivated reasoning, it can be kind of a nuisance. So I'm, I'm, it's a really interesting point about this democratization of information and communication that it can be a double-edged sword. Let's, um, you all have a great deal of experience, I'm sure viewpoints on some of the, the aspects of elections that have kind of evolved over time, whether it's um, the different forms of convenience voting, mail-in voting, um, in-person voting. Just what are your thoughts on those? How connected are these, uh, whether it's, again, vote by mail or in-person early voting to, uh, to some of the attitudes that have proliferated? Again, you've had convenience voting, as we call them. I don't mean, I was actually called out by this as, as being offensive to the disabled community, calling it convenience voting. I'm simply using the colloquial term. So mail-in, in-person early, all those different forms I'm collectively referring to as convenience voting. Has convenience voting on the whole kind of helped us? Has this proliferated over the last 10 or 15 years? Uh, is, it, is it a problem? Would you prefer to go back? We talked about sort of in-person early voting with some exceptions. What are your views on you know, all these different forms of convenience voting? It's the same people voting. Yeah. It's the same people voting. They're just, they're just voting in a more convenient time for them. It is not bringing people into the process, which is incredibly frustrating. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the turnout charts that you're seeing are more reflective of the fact that Donald Trump has done the American political system a great favor by energizing a lot of voters who were not energized before. And in fact, all these different, I mean, the political science literature would suggest that our voting levels are what they would be anyway. Right, Barry? Yeah, I, I'm, um, it's the eyeball of the beholder thing. I'm 
personally, I think we've kind of crossed a line on convenience voting to its, you know, no, no excuse, no ownership kind of thing. <laughs> I'm old fashioned. I, I, I like voting on election day. I wouldn't mind, as we talked about earlier, if you wanted to do a three day national holiday kind of thing to make it work. But, um, it, you know, it, it, it's always troubled me that I could vote six weeks before an election and you have no idea what happens in, during those six weeks that may have changed my mind. My choice, I did that, but it's kind of absolving the voter from being involved till the end. Right. Uh, old fashioned, I know, but I just. There are legitimate um, issues in terms of access to the ability to vote in in person. If you're a if you're a shift worker, if you if you're an hourly wage earner, if you don't have access to if you live in Houston, you don't have access to adequate uh, transportation, um, and so there are barriers. So you, you know we spent a long time trying to create that early vote process, but there are there are limits. But we, we can no longer have the conversation about what's a reasonable accommodation so that someone can, can vote and, and what's just, uh, it, because it doesn't give us more voters into the process. Mm -hmm. But, you know, earlier when um, Mark Jones was making his presentation about uh, it, whether you were frustrated, I, I turned in my, anybody out there turned in your uh, like vote by mail in the last election? My ballot was, elect was rejected in the primary. My wife's ballot was rejected in the primary. I got mine back in time to cure it. She did not. And I, I, vote, I, I travel a lot, so I've been voting by mail for a while. And I thought, oh, this is easy. They made a few minor changes to the way you have to fill out the, the envelope, which I didn't notice, so it, so it came back. And I consider myself a pretty, uh, uh, sophisticated voter. I was, I was furious. But the amount of time, something like, as I recall, something like 40% of the ballots, the mail-in ballots got rejected and had to be done over again because of these little tweaks that were put in designed to slow up the system. And it did. And it cost our uh, uh, elections people a lot of time and uh, energy. It, that, if they had just like printed clear instructions on the outside and said, do this, do this, do this, I would have done that and I would have been fine. But they tried to hide it <laughs> to catch me, and right. they did. Well, let's move on. That leads to a nice last, uh, last broad question, and then we'll open it up for q and I see we're supposed to be uh, hitting our market about 2.45 here. So uh, I'm going to ask you for reforms at two levels. Right? What's, a, what's a practical reform? that you think would help restore confidence in the American election system. And then give me a pie in the sky reform, a, a reform that if you could have your magic wand, you'd wave it and do this, even if it's not terribly practical. So each of you think about a practical reform and then a kind of a, if you had a magic lamp and three wishes, what would the, what's the one you'd surely use on election reform? <laughs> I'll take the easy, easy one. Please do. <laughs> which is. I, a national photo ID. National photo ID. All right. Okay, Ben? Um, I believe that you, Republicans and Democrats, both have a laundry list of reforms that they would like to put in. I think you can actually work out a general compromise that combines standards of reliability in the voting process. Certainly photo ID would be among them doing something better instead of matching signatures because like who, who writes anymore with a numerical ID uh, like they do in the state of Minnesota and now that Georgia does is an improvement that you could do. You can increase early voting days. You can get ballots counted on election day instead of the long process that, um, that drags it on. So I think if, if we weren't so wrapped up in the fraud suppression voting wars. There are uh, a set of common sense reforms that would make it better. My pie in the sky one is actually to explode the myths that each party bases its 
get out the vote fraud suppression model on. Um, for example, Republicans think you got to have a low turnout election to win. Democrats think you have to have a high turnout election to win. I believe Dr. Shaw has written uh, and, and others as well sort of exploding that myth, but yet the parties are passing laws that would sort of play to their strengths even if that is not actually true. Um, you know, absentee balloting is something that you could, a myth you could explode uh, pretty easily that in fact there are safeguards that can be put in, maybe sending universal ballots to every eligible voter is a bridge too far, but sending absentee ballot applications to every voter is some way you could also get, get full participation. So the, um, you know, we, we need to teach civics again in school. We need to, we ought to have uh, in every high school a demonstration on how to sign up to vote, how to vote, uh, uh, demonstrate voting machines, walk through what appropriate ID is, demystify the, the, the process. Um, but. You know, the, one of the, the, we also need to start talking about elections differently. We need to um, remind people that their vote matters. That's sort of, these are both my pie in the sky things. Let, let me talk about a practical change. And I was inaccurate when I said earlier that I'd, I'd been on the ballot 11 times. I've actually been on a ballot 12 times. I used to be, I was a precinct judge. I was elected precinct judge in my, little, in my precinct way back in the day, uh, precinct 60 here in, in Houston. So that was my first election was as an election judge. And I ran the election for um, a, a cycle and I was a election, I was a poll worker. And we need more of us to do that. Uh, it, there's, the more you're inside and you see how, you see how the process works and you see how uh, dedicated the folks are and they just want to do the right thing for their neighbors. And it's, uh, the, you know, actually, unfortunately, the more electronic the process gets, it makes it a little bit harder for the folks who actually run most of our elections. Who runs our elections? Retired people, because they have the time. And we need more of us to say, not just say that's their job, but uh, I won't say volunteer. It is a volunteer pos position, but you get paid for it. And uh, more of us need to step up and be a part of that process. Fantastic. Let's go to the Q&A. Uh, first question, discussed ranked choice joint primaries as a, method, as a mechanism for decreasing partisanship. What do we think of ranked choice voting and its relationship to electoral confidence or? It's idiotic. <laughs> I, look, I, um, the great thing about the country is that I can join different groups. I chose to join the Republican Party. I don't want a bunch of Democratic voters who don't believe in the same things that I do be able to vote in my primary under the guise of, oh, wouldn't Kumbaya be nice? I happen to believe in partisanship. It's, it's there, like, you got this. Yeah, I, you know, I, I want to duke it out with the Democrats on policy because I think my arguments will win. So yeah, I, oh, I could take it or leave it. No, I couldn't. <laughs> so ranked choice voting is one of the um, sort of ideas du jour that's come up since Republicans started winning election and it's a Democrat's cure to kind of readjust things. Um, I think it works in small jurisdictions, maybe Alaska, Maine. Uh, I think it is complicated and confuses voters and we're worried about credibility uh, in elections. And I also think the wily political operatives like Brother Jackson will figure out how to game ranked choice voting real, real quick so that while it'll be loved for one or two elections, it'll sort of fade away. The idea of having top four, top five uh, in primaries, where the top five primary candidates end up on the November ballot, um, might be a way to sort of 
get away from the extremes a little bit in in both parties by the way that works and sometimes the two of those are joined up and I sort of think the top four or top five ideas is, is better than ranked choice voting. I think Alaska has a top. Now I don't know that I, I would I would call ranked choice voting you know, a, 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 some kind of a democratic plot, but um, ranked choice voting is a black box for a lot of people, and I, where it works, it does moderate the, the the debate because you want to be everybody's second choice. If you're not going to be the first choice, you want to be everybody's second choice, or maybe even everybody's third choice, so that you're still in the mix at the end, and it, and it keeps you from, from trying to punch out your opponents quite as much. But, what, but it is a black box in that you cast your ballot, you've ranked your, 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 your candidates, and then it disappears into the election system, and it's not the normal process you're expecting in your head, where you, where you see the voters come out, because the way they, they, here's the first round, and then here's the next round, and they just keep rolling, and you're like, Okay, and this is all automatic, and you have no control over it anymore, and, it, and it, you start getting nervous. California and, and a number of other states have the, the, the top two finishers go on. It, it, it's actually a frustrating process where you could have 80% of the vote, and the next person has 5%, but, and then there's a bunch of little candidates down there, but you're still going to be in a runoff with that 5% person because that's the way they do it. It's a jungle primary. And, and top two finishers. There's not a great, all of them have flaws. flaws. Right. Second question, uh, what can we do about gerrymandered districts which contribute to the belief that elections are unfair? Start over again in every state legislature in the United States? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> as an old redistrictor, we named the family dog gerrymandered. So, uh, <laughs> I come, I come at this a little bit differently. Um, honestly, I described the big sort uh, phenomenon before, which is absolutely true. It makes it much, much harder to draw competitive districts without them looking really weird. I mean, think about it. Back when gerrymandering started, uh, areas were much more integrated than they are now. If you've got people living with people like themselves, then competitive districts are really hard to draw. So there's been some interesting academic articles out yeah. that show that there are maybe, I think 25 was the number of districts affected by gerrymanders right. uh, in the country today. And that half of those were due to the big sort phenomenon and you can't do much about them. And 12 of them, 12 out of 435, are political gerrymanders that you know you might be able to unwind New Hampshire's, uh, sorry, North Carolina is about to re gerrymander the state, so that'll increase the number. But Wisconsin may, uh, the legislature at least, may get, um, and congressional district may get put back the other way. And, yeah. you know, it's 12 out of 435. And she was a great dog. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see, uh, a comment a couple of elections ago, Harris County uh, had good turnout with innovative uh, voting access, I believe is the, the comment. The question, what innovations are needed to ensure uh, greater legal voter participation? Does it, that was all legal voter participation. This is just political gamesmanship. That was all legal voter participation. It was all done in a in a legal and thoughtful manner, and it it, it has been upheld. No, I think I think that's I think that's conceded in the comment. A couple okay. of elections, Harris County had good turnout with innovative voting. Act. I don't think it was a okay. accusation. It, so. it, no, but I mean, the, this is I I, I I thought I was answering the question. It is is this is just uh, the the state has stepped in because the perception is that, well, all the big cities in Texas are Democratic islands in the toxic Red Sea, and the <laughs> desire is to try to limit the, the uh, uh, participation, or perceived participation, by making, you know, cutting back hours, cutting back, uh, you know, motor voting, the, the motor voting, 24-hour voting, that was a one-off. One it seemed to work really well, but, the perception is that um, you know, by the state leadership, they need to ramp that down. Well, let me let me paraphrase the question then. I mean, is, is we've talked about uh, convenience voting. Some of these arrangements is basically cannibalizing election day voting for the mm -hmm. most part. So, what might we do? 
Um, you know, there's some evidence that, uh, uh, you know, uh, voter information guides seem to make voters feel better if they don't necessarily increase, and they're quite expensive, but make them feel a little better about the process. In California, I've seen some data. Is, is there anything out there that might actually appreciably affect voter turnout that we should be considering? Boy, I've tried to do that how many times? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think candidates drive voter turnout. Yeah. To the extent the implication is, is that turnout is depressed because of the lack of credibility in elections and people are just turned off by it. I think you can do some projects that look at the entire election system and do kind of a public education campaign about how each part of the election system have safeguards in it that make votes accurate and, uh, and, and fair. So, I mean, I think there's some education things you can do. I'm sure you'll enjoy this one. Can you talk about elect the election denying business with the parenthetical reference to Fox News and the, the Dominion voting case? I'm gonna leave that one to the Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about, I think, from the consulting um, side of things, but what about uh, the, the media side? I, so, as long as media are profit centers and they figure out their audiences, then it's going to be there. It, 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 and, and you can do it in under the guise of I'm educating, I'm not advocating, which I think yeah. is distinction without difference, but I, I don't think it goes away. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the other thing about this, which which we take for granted, is that so so much we've brought upon ourselves because of the First Amendment, and nobody wants to get rid of that. Some people will argue, well, can't we put this little tweak on it or that little tweak on it? But at the end of the day, it is kind of the beauty of you know the craziness of the American system. I can stay sit here and say whatever I want, including just flat out lying. <laughs> And it's up to the voters to pass judgment on me for that. Right. So a reflection of our polarized society is, and the social media and the, the advent of different forms of communication, is that the entire media landscape is much more in silos. And it's not so big. So that, you know, the diagnostics that the TV networks have now is such that they can look in any small increment of time and see what stories people are liking or turning away from. So, you know, Fox on a Good Night has three million viewers and uh, MSNBC has 1.5 and CNN has 1.2, but they're all looking at the dials, and so they recognize that their audience are politically segmented, and so they're playing to that audience. So there's, you know, it, it, it is also true with newspapers and their audiences as they fight for clicks more than selling hard copies, so that the, the messages and what news outlets do is very much catered to their audience these days more than it was 10 years ago and so you get kind of jaundiced pictures from any outlet you read or watch that's why you gotta read a whole bunch of things and, it, and, and, and just to drive that home as short time ago as a decade ago if you were in a campaign or you were in governance AP mattered because nearly every major news outlet in the country subscribed and in a little paper or a mid-sized paper the ap stringer or the ap national security whatever that was on the front page of the paper that doesn't exist anymore i mean ap is just a shell of itself and it, and it gets to this optimization model that and i'll go back because i'm freaked out about chat gpt that I can create content <clears throat> to monetize my ridiculous yeah. theories. Yeah. And that's what's happening. Yeah, well, I'm just, yeah, so yeah, I'm just, the vast majority of Americans aren't watching Fox, uh, yeah. MSNBC, or CNN. They're watching reality TV. Yeah. So. 
I was going to say, isn't I'm, this reality TV? Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> I just finished creating a bunch of uh, finals, and uh, I'm also quite concerned about ChatGPT. Um, <laughs> but a noticeable improvement in some students' answers <laughs> over the course of the semester. It was your teaching, Darren. Yeah, um, and, and earlier to paraphrase, uh, when Barry was answering the question, it reminded me there was a uh, conversation I heard a sports talk where uh, a guy was relating a story, he's talking to Donald Meyer. Uh, the reporter was asking Don Olmeyer at NBC about why the NFL had changed some of their rules, why they had done this or that, and Don Olmeyer, about halfway through the question, puts his hand and says, stop. The answer to all your questions is money, um, which I think <laughs> speaks a little bit to what Barry was saying. Um, I attended the Israel 75 event last week, noted the civil measured language of the diplomats who spoke. How do we return to an age of civil discourse and can a group like No Labels, whose mission is bipartisanship and et cetera, et cetera, uh, be considered healthy for democracy? Uh, there's a related question. What is the possibility of a major third party? Um, so as we kind of move towards the, the close of the conversation, uh, I guess two separate but possibly related items. Uh, can we or how can we return to more civil discourse? And then are there any legitimate prospects for a third party in the near to midterm future? I'll do the civil discourse thing, which is it has to start at the top. You know, um, just because of the way coverage comes about, and it's not meant a, at a whack at any particular elected official or candidates out there, but it, it, I'm very focused on the Hill. I, that's my first job. I'm House representatives. I will always be a House person. And it's horrifying to me on both the left and the right, the language that they use on the floor of the house, which there used to be rules about that and they're just not enforceable. So I think that's a big thing. And, it, and because you identify with a party or do you identify with a set of issues, I do think the average citizen, average voter, will take their cues off of who they view as their leaders. I don't think this is a bottom-up kind of thing. I think it's top-down when they say it's okay to be disrespectful and rant. Let me offer a model specifically in the election area, in election distrust area, that actually is going to disagree with my old buddy Barry. And that's to deal with election distrust and lack of confidence and election denialism on a very local level. Um, because the national debate, as you, we've sort of demonstrated, is really, really poisonous. And the theory behind this, and it's a nonprofit that I'm co chairing with a Democratic colleague of mine, is to go into the most contentious election counties in the country. Harris County could actually qualify for, for that. And to get what we call the pillars of the community to meet with the local election officials. So it'll be like the Trump hardware store owner and people from the faith community across the political spectrum and civic organization heads and medical professionals, the most trusted voices in the community, to meet with the election official to understand the safeguards that are in the local community's election system. And so for those pillars of the community to be a group that reinforces the credibility of the election system. There's a tight election. They're not calling who wins and loses. They're not lobbying on different legislative choices. They are kicking the tires of the election system and recognizing that a stable community is a prosperous community, and if you're blowing up over election charges and counter charges, that's really not good for the community. So it is very much a plea for community pride and solidarity um, as a way to fight election denialism uh, as opposed to the national debate that I think is kind of a mosh pit at the moment. Well, I, it's not so much a disagreement because it's, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's also it's not really, it's both. But, but, no, but, but I, the reason I, I want to say it is because, you know, Darren, all of, all of your side of the structure of the academic side of this 
is survey after survey, well, I like my congressman, is all those other ones that are the problem. And I think what you're talking about is that validation theory. Yeah, and if you can do it in the, in the half dozen counties, dozen counties around the country where the fights over the wars are the most pitched, then perhaps you can attack this on a sort of scalable level. So Al Sharpton and Mike Liddell on a road tour. <laughs> it's not exactly the way we conceptualize it. <laughs> Any thoughts on civil discourse and third parties? I, I, I repeat that I, I do think that it, American democracy works pretty well at the, at the local level. Um, and agree that it starts at the top, but it also, it also comes from the bottom. We all have to get more involved. We have to volunteer in elections. We have to uh, be a part of these conversations. The, the third party, no. Uh, the system is designed across the country. I mean, the system, each state has their own process, but the states are set up in such a way it's to make it extremely difficult for a third party to wedge their way into. Let, let me process. ask, as a final question, let me ask that third party question in a slightly different way. How confident are you in the abilities of the Republican and Democratic parties as currently constituted to adequately, <laughs> to do what? En to <laughs> adequately <laughs> engage voters moving forward? It's not done by the parties anymore. I mean, the parties have become less and less relevant. I mean, parties did three things. You can gauge this for yourselves. Parties essentially do three things, the three M's. They raise money, they do voter mobilization, and they do messaging for their party. And in none of those three areas, as opposed to before McCain-Feingold in 2004, but in none of those three areas are the parties the most dominant force so that any candidate can now go out and run his or her own campaign. The parties are a less and less relevant part of it. Um, and that leads to, that means more polarizing forces can find their candidates, which contributes to the morass we've been talking about. So is it random then? What do you mean? Let me say that, uh, you know, I think we would agree that Donald Trump basically took over the Republican Party lock, stock, and barrel. Bernie Sanders gave it a good run, but didn't take over the Democratic Party. Is it likely that rogue candidates then are going to define the parties moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think they do already on a local level. You, you can't look at the married bunches on both political sides in the U.S. House of Representatives and think that they're getting their strength in either money or mobilization, volunteers, or in messaging from the political parties, they're driving it on their own by going to their own sources of revenue and their own people who believe in their causes and groups that are going to put uh, independent expenditure ads on TV. No, and I'll say, because you said McCain-Feingold, and not to geek out on this, but up until McCain-Feingold, if you compared the impact and power of the RNC versus the DNC, there was no comparison. The RNC was a centralized structure. It had control over the state parties. It raised money. It helped sort out the primaries. It was a power center. On the Democratic side, the DNC was kind of a, a ministerial role, and it was the outside efforts, the labor unions and the funders and all, that was the power structure. So, so you know, in, in your Bernie Sanders thing, it was re less relevant other than what the primary rules were for him because the power structure for him was always outside of the DNC, mm -hmm. e even setting aside his self-identification as a socialist. On my side, we had to completely relearn how this worked, and we unleashed forces that before because of the RNC and the way the state parties operated, could somehow be managed. And now it's out of our control. Even before McCain filed, the Democrats and all their groups could work together. Now they can't even work together. Yeah. And, and would you 
concede that there's a really not a functioning Republican Party any longer? Yeah, I don't, I... Well, the parties only do basically two things. They run the conventions, the presidential nominating conventions. They still do that. Mm -hmm. And they also, to some small degree, run the, um, the presidential primary rules, although that's really devolved to the states a great deal, too. Yeah. All right. With that, we'll conclude our session. I believe that John has a few departing words. So. I was going to say, we should thank Darren for such an uplifting session. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're pretty much in violent agreement with each other up here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it should be scary to America. Uh, news alert. Avery Davis Roberts says that anybody would like to come tonight and is a little hungry, please be at Hungry's at Rice Village, 2356 Rice Boulevard, Houston, Texas. And uh, they're going to be a little bit of a little bit of collaboration celebration right after this. So head straight over there, unless you're heading back. Uh, and Avery, thanks to you, to our panelists so much. And uh, thanks to everybody who attended live and via the internet. Working with, as I said earlier, working with David Carroll, uh, David Avery, and the folks at the Carter Center has been a blessing and a, and a joy. And we're looking at keeping this uh, collabor collaboration alive. And I couldn't conclude without thanking all the people at the Baker Institute, Laura Hotze, Joelle Paulson, Serena Storm, Sean O'Neill, Kevin Young, Leah Gross, David Satterfield, and Mark Jones, my colleague in the, in the program. Thanks so much. Have a nice evening. And see you at the Hungry Hungries.